<laughs> to, to order. Um, note attendance, please, Andrew. Yeah. And we have a quick consent agenda, two hires that we need to take care of since school is fastly, fast approaching. So is there a motion for approval for those? I'll uh, move for approval. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> okay. Consent agenda passes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andy, who's going to show us a little bit from their administrator retreat the other day. And yeah, thanks, Jim. This isn't on the agenda, so I, I only want to take a couple of minutes, but it's, it's, it's pretty important stuff. Uh, but I, I think that you will uh, appreciate this. I think, all of you know, uh, I took the administrative team to uh, Oregon State University a couple of weeks ago, uh, the first day of our uh, administrator in service, and uh, uh, took them through a challenge course, uh, which about six hours. Uh, of uh, team building, uh, uh, unified efforts, just quite a few themes that are uh, built in throughout the day and a number of ground uh, activities as well as upper elevation activities. Anyway, I'm not going to show you the, all of the gory details, so to speak, but I do want to show you a couple of video clips that are, are I think, uh, help describe, partially describe the purpose for the day, what we were doing, but I think second of all, maybe even more importantly, uh, the, the second video, a series of videos, is about perseverance, and, and, and it's... <laughs> the gore is actually what I was hoping to see. Uh, the gore. <laughs> I didn't uh, was, was there a gore? Yeah, I, mean, I got in a fight with Hannah, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, and there's Mr. Swenson coming off. He's delayed, and this is this is what's really quite a safe event. And if any of you are thinking district insurance, yes, we got district insurance approval for this. Uh, but uh, uh, let me, the, here's a uh, uh, one of the highlights of the day was a zip line, and this is uh, Kevin Palmer uh, enjoying himself on the zip line. Here, you get those back lights. Good. Now back to retreat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. We should, we should be doing that. Good boy. This, this is probably one of the more. Uh, <laughs> More cha challenging events of the day. Eric, what's the name of this? Uh, you stand on top of a pole and you jump to a trapeze bar. Uh, this is Eric, uh, and, and this is a perfect example. There's, there's really no volume at this point. This is a perfect example of, of students attempting oaks, and for some students it just takes more than once. Uh, and you'll see the purpose here very quickly. That's probably a 10, maybe a 12 inch pole, and Eric is belayed off. You can see the and you have somebody on the ground holding him, just, just in case he misses. He's about 25 to 30 feet in the air. Um, so that's attempt, first attempt. So the second attempt. And you can see Linda Myers to the left there on the horizontal beam. Oh, no. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> it looks like it's far, huh? Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. especially on the bottom, it looks like it's really yeah. yeah. And this is a little more extended, it's a little longer segment. It'll show Eric here in just a moment on his third oaks again. Uh, but this is Teresa Gerlitz on the left, assistant principal at the high school, and Linda Myers on the right, um, curriculum director. They're receiving some instructions from the ground, but they, they, they need to speak up there about how they're going to get past each other. Is that Marilyn and Linda? No, that's uh, Linda and uh, Therese. Or Therese. And by design, they're supposed to hug. It's a safe way to get past each other. <laughs> and, and Eric, of course, is standing up. He's still all tight. <laughs> still trying. Right? Slid the way away. Where do I go? He can't jump because when he jumps, it makes things bounce a little bit. Did that idea? Yeah. Now what do you do? Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> the sword. <laughs> now you do pull-ups. Yeah. Oh man. So, I was feeling so locked up after that that I thought I'm like. That's pretty good. And they have uh, belayed devices that actually lower them down. They're these really metal brackets that you slip the rope through and they come down. Um, very safe. <laughs> Poor trees. Greg Potts was uh, not being very nice. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's the extent of the, those videos. I wanted to make sure that you folks uh, got a chance to see that. Uh, hi, Wally. Hi. We got to grab those lights. It's like crazy. You never even rock climbing, huh? I've done that before, but I just don't like dangling. It's pretty good. Like so, so <laughs> with, with that, I, I want to. Um, uh, each one of you received not only a copy of the agenda, but you received a copy of a, of a sub-agenda uh, for, for this evening specific to your uh, visioning and strategic uh, planning and visioning uh, portion of the meeting. And so I, um, I'm going to refer you to that uh, and uh, want to take a moment and introduce uh, Jerry and, and Jim to you. And, and uh, Jerry and, and, and Jim co uh, come to you with, uh, with many years of experience uh, um, individually, not just combined uh, in, in the education world, as uh, both as teachers and as administrators for, for many years, and, and have uh, worked through not, uh, their own respective districts historically, as well as other districts in doing exactly what they're doing here. So I think they're a very good choice for this district uh, in, in, in developing a, a visioning process, or using a visioning process to establish quite a few things that I think are, are needed in this district. And, and if you recall the last few years, we, we've spoken on occasion about the need to go through a strategic planning process and what that looks like and, and how important that is for uh, a reference document in this district as well as something to keep each of you as, as board, I think, um, uh, uh, as one element, but also as, as a, a significant reference for me as superintendent and all the administrators to use in decision making and, 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 and direction as we move ahead in uh, with challenges ahead for any school district, and those, of course, specific to Silver Falls. So with that, I'm going to let them do the majority of the talking, but um, I'm going to introduce each of the board members to you. And Jerry, Jim, if you want to come up to these chairs, those are reserved for you. Uh, I'll do that. And I've given, I know I've given you, each of you the names of, of our board members, but now you put names with, uh, with, with faces. So on, on your left is uh, Owen Von Flew. Uh, Owen is uh, an attorney uh, in, in town. Uh, next to him is Tom Buchholz. Tom is a business owner and a farmer. Uh, Wally Learman is a, a manager at Intel and, and also a, a farmer. Do I dare say part-time farmer? Is there such a thing, Wally? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Tim Roth is uh, a, a local farmer as well, full-time uh, farmer, even in the wintertime, whatever you guys do, I don't know. <laughs> uh, David Beeson, which I believe uh, one or both of you may know. And, uh, good to see you. Good to see you. And I, I, David has described himself, and this is accurate, as a farmer and artist, uh, and I think that's still accurate Rancher. to this day. Rancher. 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 Excuse me, sorry, sorry David. <laughs> Lake, Lakeview. Rancher. Lakeview. I have to remember right. Lakeview. Yeah. Farmers spend the winter in the coffee shops. <laughs> Rancher's are not working. <laughs> and Julie Norris is uh, Julie Norris, Norris on your right, and Julie is a office manager for a local uh, dentist, uh, which happens to be the dentist that I go to was so embarrassed recently when I literally drooled on her desk. Carlos has to get that on video. <laughs> And our seventh member, Irv Stadley, uh, is an excavator, business owner, and is in North Dakota. I do have Skype set up, and Irv is hoping to Skype with us this evening at some point. Uh, and so hopefully you'll get a chance to meet him. Jim, Jerry, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Jimmy, did you want to say anything more about your background? 
Sure. I think, I think a little bit uh, because uh, it's, I think it's important for you to know a little bit about uh, where we come from uh, since you, uh, uh, you know, you're going to be working with us pretty closely over the next lots of months. Um, so again, my name is Jim Abbott. Uh, this is my uh, 34th year uh, in education in Oregon. Uh, uh, started out as a teacher several years, principal several years, superintendent uh, lots of years, um, and uh, of both uh, school districts and ESDs. And, and I think that uh, helps bring a little bit of uh, perspective um, given that uh, one of the, the primary functions that a successful ESD superintendent uh, must perform is, I had 20 districts, I was the largest ESD in the state, at 20 districts uh, to try to bring them together to find common purpose and, and work together for the good of all. And uh, not an easy task, but one that's uh, definitely accomplishable. Um, uh, it, it, interwoven in all of that, uh, certainly been involved in many, many um, uh, uh, planning projects uh, with, as Andy said, uh, school districts uh, where, uh, where I worked, but also uh, with school districts uh, in the capacity as a consultant. And uh, it's, I think it's rewarding work because I strongly believe in uh, a district having uh, you know, the purpose and the vision very, very clear out there for everyone to understand what it is, and then from that direction, uh, creating uh, specific plans year by year that you're going to accomplish. That gives confidence to your staff, it brings uh, your district into a holistic uh, view for the community, and it gives the community confidence that you know where you're going and they know where you're going and that their kids are in good hands. So that's, that's uh, I have a passion about this work and I'm anxious to get started uh, with you all, but uh, that's just something about my background. Thank you, Eric. Um, See, I recently retired from superintendent of the Beaverton School District, and since that time, I've been working with Jim on this kind of work. Um, I work for COSA on a contract basis in the new superintendent mentoring program. So each year, the new superintendents in the state have an opportunity to go through a year-long mentoring program where they're given a mentor, and then we bring them in for five workshops during the year, and this will be my third year in that. And I'm working um, as a contract consultant for Education Northwest in Portland, and that's a nonprofit that does a lot of work on research and evaluation. <coughs> Uh, and uh, grant applications. Um, I was asked by the state superintendent recently to apply for a position on the Board of Education, State Board of Education. I'll find out whether that goes through in January. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that's a possibility because I think this is a really good time to be in a role to help make a difference in state law. But I uh, love your town, love this community. My wife and I come here often to the Oregon Garden and we just don't ever seem to fatigue a bit. Also, there's some great buys to go there. Wonderful opportunities on some of the packages they offer. I think it's a beautiful town with a, a great tradition, uh, good strong school district. Both Jim and I knew Craig Rossler very well and worked with him closely. So. It's an honor to be here with you. I'm going to kick off the very first part of this, speaking about the general kind of things that happen, good and not so good, in this strategic visioning process. And I, I don't mean to come across as negative. I more want to alert you about what some of the problems are that are so commonly encountered which um, added up meaning that a little over 80% of all organizations, public and private, that have strategic visioning processes, documents, and plans are not able to carry out the goals that they've identified. So a little less than 20% 
are successful. And there's some very specific reasons for that, why they're successful and why they aren't. Um, the Harvard Business School did a study of this recently. As a result of this information, now in the private sector, one of the key characteristics that CEOs are hired for is their ability to carry out strategic initiatives because it's so uh, common for it not to be able to be completed and realized. And one of the reasons for that is that the documents um, become static. They're not a living document. It's not something that is continually looked at and with changing uh, conditions modified so that the goals that were originally identified still make sense, they're still measurable, they're still able to be accomplished. And in your case, my hope is uh, early on with whatever form the document is, and if it's, say, a three-year period, that you have some kind of periodic way to relook at it and um, make adjustments as necessary. So the first point is have a living document. And the second is, um, sad to say, most of these plans and the time put into them and the energy put into them make very little difference in the daily operations of the overall organization, private or public. Um, by and large, the great emphasis is put in on the development and where the emphasis really needs to be, it's on the implementation. So we have a year of flurry and activity. We get our document in place. We've spent a really a great amount of time doing so. But if we measure the amount of time that's actually spent on implementation, especially at the board level, um, we find that it is nowhere near the amount of time that was put in on the development. Also, uh, when you think about it, the development is the easy part. It's not really very difficult to make plans about anything. What's really difficult is the ability to carry the plans out. And so we'll want to talk to you about monitoring and um, adjusting and um, accountability around what is finally decided on. I want to say again, the difficulty is not in creating a plan, although it may seem so like it as we're going through it. It's really the execution of the plan, implementing it. That's the hard part. That's where the energy needs to be. A lot of the plans, um, you might think, well, maybe some of the reasons why 80% of them don't seem to come to fruition might be that they selected the wrong strategies. Strategies just didn't fit. The goals weren't maybe the right goals. But no, it's in the execution of those goals and again, the implementation. So if there's a weakness, it's usually not what was selected. Almost all of the goals are worthy goals. Uh, it's hard to look at any strategic plan or visioning process and say, boy, those things don't make sense. But if we look deeper and we find where there's cases of failure, it's that next step of taking it from a plan and putting it into practice. In other words, as a board member, when this plan is in place, you should be able to go to different parts of the district and be able to see living evidence of what it is that we're trying to do. And um, that sometimes is, is hard to see. Um, another big issue, and I know that you find that in your board meetings, is we feel as though for school board members, the most power, the most absolute influence, the greatest um, thing that you can do as a board member is to be um, developing policy. And yet so often what happens is we are caught up on more routine daily kinds of matters that come into um, our agendas and also uh, the superintendent and the leadership staff. 
And so what the point I'm trying to make to you now is that as these plans come forward, it's really, really hard. And I, I'm certainly guilty of everything here that I'm mentioning, of, you know, the, the negative sides or the difficult sides. It's so easy for those day-to-day -day routine kind of flare-ups to take over the importance of long-term goals that are really going to make a difference. And there has to be some way of being able to stay on track with the focus. To look at um, our agendas and our business and say, you know, I realize the greatest power that we have is in policy, uh, developing new policy, uh, helping to have the goals of the organization carried out. Does this item fit that category? Is this a priority that we should be spending our time on? With the incredible needs that children have in our school system, and the great diversity and the difficulty that classroom teachers are facing, are these the items that our energy needs to go to? And what I would submit to you is the answer is yes, if you're carrying out the strategic plan that you bring forward. Um, another area to keep in mind early on as we go into this is what are we going to do about the consequences, the accountability measures? We put a plan in place. We say we want to do this. What are you going to do as a board if we're not making progress? What is Andy going to do as superintendent? What is the leadership team going to do? There needs to be some consequences for lack of performance. And it doesn't need to be a negative con consequence. It may be that we say, let's take, we, we haven't made any progress in this area on the last, in the last 12 months. And we relook at what it is that we decided on, and we may find that that's not a realistic goal. That conditions may have changed um, for whatever reason. That's why the living document piece is important. It's a way of having accountability. If your document is static, it's not very much accountability. And also, what do we do if things are really going well? Does it say to us that maybe on certain things we've identified, maybe we were a little lower in our grasp than we should have been? Can we reach a little bit higher? So there needs to be that accountability around. What do we do? we're not making progress. It isn't true here, thank goodness, but one of the biggest problems is the turnover in leadership. Now, Jim, you may have seen something differently, and you as well, Andy, but the last research that I looked at on the national level, the average tenure of a superintendent of all sizes of school districts put together is two years and seven months. Well, if you have a five-year strategic plan and you bring in a new superintendent halfway through, what almost always happens is the old is thrown out. Those goals weren't achieved, and now we bring a whole new set of goals. And, you know, you're into that kind of a cycle. Very common, especially for the really large districts in the nation, of that constant turnover and no accomplishment of goals, just a series of new goals coming forward. I'm going to pause for a second and uh, just see if you have any questions or comments on anything I've said so far, or any additions by Jim or Andy or Eric. Well, no. I just, I just want to mention that and kind of uh, agree with Jerry. Uh, there, there's so many uh, districts out there and so many plans, uh, but not, not necessarily quality plans, and, and, and quite a few districts don't have any plans at all. And you know the old saying, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they didn't plan to fail, but they failed to plan. And so planning is important, but Jerry's right. And, and when I go over the next part of this uh, agenda with you, uh, you're gonna see that we have in mind uh, intense follow-up uh, for, for how this will work because I know when I was a teacher somebody gave me something from the district office and I put it on the shelf and uh, I learned pretty quickly that I never even had to look at it 
didn't have, didn't have to even worry about it because I was never accountable to it. Uh, and the same thing as, as a principal. Uh, you learn that things come and go, superintendents come and go, board members come and go, and you, you do your own thing. But that's not what we want to be a part of, and we're hoping that that's not what you want to be a part of, that you want to be a part of something that's, that's uh, 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 strong, that's, that has clear direction, and, and has some accountability to it, and everyone knows that, that everyone's accountable. Board members, all staff, community members, students, everyone's accountable as we, as we uh, go through and, and attempt to accomplish this plan. So uh, I can't uh, emphasize enough what Jerry's saying. That's where the failure happens, is you celebrate, we've got a plan, put it on the shelf, and uh, tie a bow on it, and what, what, we, what shall we do next? Well, uh, one other comment I guess I'll make, and that is, when I was a principal, I knew that I needed to be in classrooms. I knew that's where I needed to be if we were going to change what uh, students were doing. Um, but I will tell you, if a principal, um, even subconsciously, decides there's so many little tiny bits of minutia that you can deal with every single day and never get to the important stuff, and guess what? Superintendents can do that, board members can do that, whole communities can do that, because you get distracted by all those little things, and they seem important. You're dealing with them, and the day, the week, the month, the year is gone, but you did all that stuff, and you were busy, and you're tired, and yet, quite frankly, didn't get at the most important uh, thing that you want to get at in your district, which is, the growth of those students holistically and student achievement in particular. So uh, that's what we're about, and, and uh, I'll let Jerry go on, but I, I'm passionate about that part about uh, uh, accountability and making sure that everyone's working together on this and it's not put on a shelf and forgotten. And you'll see we have some ideas for that. I've got two other areas that I want to mention in the problem part. And the first one is too many goals. There's a Chinese proverb that says, if you chase two rabbits, you end up catching neither of them. And I think that um, in this particular area, so often you'll see a large variety of goals. And when you have many goals, there's not very much um, accountability, I would say. And in many cases, if even board members or the superintendent doesn't have the list in front of them, they can't recite them all. So too many goals leads to a lack of focus. And um, in these times of limited funding, I think what we want to aim toward is doing a few things really well. Uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, I was superintendent of the Redmond School District. And I convinced the school board, along with others, that we should only have one goal. One goal for five years, and it was to increase the reading and writing and math levels of our students up to the state average. And we worked down quite a bit, and that was a very worthy long-term goal. But that was it. That was the total goal, and we had great, great success over time with it. When I see large lists of goals, it reminds me that um, the accountability is lacking because if I say there's only one or two things I'm trying to do, it's pretty well known what those are. The choices when it comes time to funding, it's pretty easy to say, you know, we have these one or two or three areas. And there are many, many areas that usually doesn't happen, which brings me into the other problem, and that's adequate funding. If we put together a strategic vision for the future, and let's say there's maybe three to five items on it, 
and we don't see as the budget process takes place over the years of time that the plan is in place, a change in funding, where funding, even when we have restricted funding, is flowing from other areas into our strategic plan goals, then what that says is, yes, we've added a plan, but we're not going to necessarily fund it. And that takes a lot of discipline now when we're cutting staff and doing a variety of other things. So I think a really good measure of the passion of the district for the plans that they put together and the goals they say they want to achieve is to see an actual difference in funding going toward those items. And that is a, a pretty big problem with the accomplishment of plans. I've just got a few minutes left on this topic, so I'd like to um, talk about what are the routes for success. Those that seem to be in that 20% that do achieve their goals in a timely manner. And the first one is very hard, and we'll struggle with it as we go through it. It is selecting the proper metrics to measure the goals. What we say we want to do, we have to have some measures in place. And these measures need to have some timelines to them. They need to be realistic. There needs to be consequences in place of uh, if we don't, uh, if we're not successful, what do we do about that? And sometimes a great deal of time is put in on identifying the goals and a very little amount of time in how we're going to measure them. And I would say that of all parts of the process, I particularly have found it the most perplexing. But when it's done right, when the measurements are done right, and those involved in implementing believe those are fair and realistic measures, it really makes a difference. Um, a second area, again, a very difficult one, but an important one, there needs to be some way for every employee in the district to be able to say that they have a part in carrying out some phase, at least, of the overall plan uh, or direction. Um, and there needs to be not just the school board who owns it, and not just the superintendent, and not just the leadership team, but somehow we need to make it a way that every employee in the district can feel as though there's a part for them. You know, without ownership, it's very difficult for these things to move forward. What they say is, yeah, the district office wants us to. Um, this came from the school board. I didn't have any input. I don't even know what it says. That's so common. And I think if we want to break the mold and be successful and really take a step up, we need to figure out ways that individuals uh, transportation department, the food service department, the maintenance department, there needs to be some ways that they can in, grasp onto this and feel there's something for them to do. Take some creative thinking and know. We talked about the constant monitoring and adjusting. That's an, a very important piece. And I think the last one that I, I'd like to um, Leave, leave you with is the urgency, a sense of urgency from the school board and from the superintendent that this is the most important thing we're doing together this year. So what I would say to you is in the 2013-2014 school year, based on what we know can happen when these are done right, based on some of the survey information that both Jim and I have had a chance to read that mentions about um, uh, the district uh, delving into a, a stronger vision for the future. I would say of all the work that you're going to do this next year over the full year, I don't mean in any one month or one meeting, that this should be seen as the most important thing that you do. And there's a second part of that, and that is it seems to me as though you would not have a school board meeting 
or a work session where in some way you weren't getting reports back, uh, asking questions, giving advice and counsel um, about the plan so that it's kind of an every month thing with you. Um, and then finally, I talked to Andy about this a little bit in one of our earlier meetings. There is an education consultant, professor, author, writer by the name of Doug Reeves, and he's been heavily involved in education improvement, especially in schools and districts that have not been doing well, have high poverty, um, diversity, mobility, etc. And he said, the last thing as a principal that I could ever do would be to start the school year in front of my staff and say, and by the way, we're implementing a brand new curriculum this year in reading, and at the same time say, and we're taking some of these things off your plate so that you're able to do it. So I talked to Andy about the idea, what would he take off of his plate that he's already doing now to make room for hopefully the most important work that he's gonna do this year. And as a school board, to really get involved in this, to really get in with the creation of it, looking at those metrics, being able to um, see if the goals are really in line with where the community would like to see the district go in the future. What are you going to stop doing as a result of this so that you can prioritize your time? I just came from Education Northwest, uh, one of the groups that I, I work with, uh, meeting with the CEO for lunch today. And um, I talked to him about this concept. And he said, you know, I've been doing that here since I came four years ago. And he said, the thing that I do that makes it work is I monitor that they're not doing the things that either I told them not to do or that they said they would do in order to move forward the more important things with higher priority. That's the first time I've heard that. I have heard of people saying, and now we're going to do this and not talk about taking anything away. Because you know education is an additive business. Really hard for teachers to stop doing anything. Really hard for board members to stop. We just take it on. But he said, yes, I do monitor them. And if we've made a decision that they're going to stop doing something, I'm going to measure them on that, and they're going to know it. And so I thought that was a very, very strategic way of trying to prioritize and focus. Well, those are, those are some thoughts and ideas. Appreciate the opportunity to offer them to you. And I'll jump in here and there where I can. I wish we had a little bit more time to discuss that. But every item on the agenda that we have is uh, kind of a good starting meeting point. So I don't want to take uh, Jim's time. Thank you. Well, one thing I want you to know for certain is that, uh, yes, we are talking quite a bit uh, today because we want to give you a flavor of, uh, after looking at your district, uh, uh, the kind of process that, that, that we are recommending that you put into place to uh, uh, produce that, that quality plan at, uh, at the end of this year. Uh, but I assure you that uh, it's 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 kind of like uh, <laughs> uh, my my uh, first administrative position uh, was as a, a vice principal for a short period of time, and I arrived in October, and I really didn't know what I was doing. I, I they gave me a desk and an office and a phone, and the phone never rang, and I didn't have anything to do. I went to the principal and I said, you know, about the second day, I said, you know, I, 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 uh, I would like to have some assignments or I'm going to start doing, some, making some projects or something. He said, you know what, Jim? He said, just take advantage of this nice time you have here because it's going to explode. <laughs> it was good advice because it did. The reason I bring that up is as we go through this process here, you're going to see that we have in mind 
for the board to be quite involved, and we're going to have sessions with you that uh, you're going to be uh, the center of attention where we're really wanting to get some information out of you and some ideas out of you and, and some brainstorming from you in addition uh, you know, to the entire community. So uh, I, I hope that uh, you uh, recognize that, that uh, uh, we want to lay out our plan for you tonight, but there's a whole lot of uh, things we have in mind for you as, as board members. Um, so Jerry talked about you know, the importance of a, of a plan and more importantly, the carrying out of that plan, where things can go wrong, what the pitfalls might be, et cetera. Um, what I'd like to show you is, if you're going to launch any sort of a planning process, you've got to plan for the planning. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, we put together this calendar that I want to go uh, through with you, and uh, and then uh, some notes off to the side on a second sheet that I passed out that you'll see uh, made reference to as we go through. Uh, as you can see, uh, starting on that timeline in, in July, uh, we met uh, uh, with Andy and talked about uh, you know this as you know a possibility is. Is there some sort of uh, project here? Uh, and uh, this month, uh, you know, you all uh, approved the uh, contract with us, and we're here now uh, meeting you as as a full board and going through this process. And of course, uh, hopefully, uh, you'll have questions, and we'll certainly modify this uh, if needed. Because I want to emphasize a very important point here. Jerry and I both um, believe this with any project that we do. Uh, this is your project, it's not ours. Uh, we have some experience in, in these areas in, in, in putting together uh, these, these types of plans, but I want you to know that it's yours and you're the driver. Uh, we, we are going to help you steer, we're going to help you get there, but at any point in time where you say, hold it, I'm not comfortable with that, that's not what I think we ought to be doing, uh, we want to be involved in that discussion and we would certainly be flexible. Having said that, just as when Jerry was a superintendent, when I was a superintendent, we won't hesitate to tell you that if, we, if you talk about going this way and we think it could be detrimental uh, to go that way, we'll tell you very strongly uh, why and uh, we won't hesitate. So uh, we're, we're, uh, we're not yes men here, that's for sure. But we understand it's your, it's your uh, district, it's your plan, it's, you're in charge. And so at any time, call time out and say, wait a minute, this is not uh, comfortable. Um, before uh, the month is out, uh, Jerry and I, individually and together, intend to review all of the documents that, that you and the administration identify as key documents of the district. It's very important to understand uh, what those documents are, why they exist, uh, the importance of each one, and, and uh, whether or not uh, they ought to continue being key documents moving forward uh, is, is a question that you'll answer uh, going forward also. Next month, it's very, very important that we meet with uh, the board, meet with uh, administrators, uh, and identify who might be focus group participants. And so on the second sheet that I passed out to you, it uh, it's, says project process descriptions at the top, and identify focus group participants. So we, we intend to, uh, and anytime I say chair or vice chair or the full board or whatever, uh, they can be interchangeable. The board, will, you'll decide how you want to do that. Uh, so uh, meet with the chair and vice chair or the full board, however you want to do that, along with the administrative team to take a strong look at who might be focus group participants uh, in both individuals and groups in this district. And, and the idea here is, if you're going to go forward with a, with a multi-year plan for this, for this school district, 
who are the, the, the players out there that you want to hear from uh, that can help us start putting together some ideas to bring back to you uh, for your kind of brainstorming sessions. If you can begin to think about that prior to next month, uh, who might be the, those key folks in the community, uh, being staff and students and uh, community members, whether they have kids in the school or not, who might those people be who we can sit down, have a conversation with about the future of the Silver Falls School District? That's, that's what we're looking at here in, as far as identifying those groups. Uh, and so then we're, we're going to want to notify them, ask them if they're interested. Jerry and I can be pretty persuasive. Uh, you know, there's civic duty and all. And uh, we'll want them to uh, be involved and we'll want to schedule those meetings to take place over October and November. So Jerry and I will uh, come into the community and we will uh, meet with each one of those groups. We don't know how many there will be yet. There, there may be many. Uh, but how, whatever number there is, we'll take care of it and, and, uh, and sit down with those groups and, and, uh, and get information uh, from them. Uh, by the way, that will mean, uh, in my opinion anyway, also uh, meeting uh, with each individual board member and, and getting ideas uh, from each of you as to where you think uh, this district might be headed, where, what direction you'd like it to go, uh, what are the key components of that. Uh, we also are going to need to uh, develop uh, the, the focus group questions. And so we have a process here that we recommend uh, doing that. Uh, after we have reviewed those key documents that I've talked about, uh, we'll come up with a draft of, of key questions, uh, focus group questions uh, that we think uh, might be helpful in getting information uh, from those, those folks that you identify. Um, I mentioned here that some questions are going to be designed for groups, some questions will be designed for individuals, some will work with both. Uh, but we will um, uh, want to have uh, both those types of questions. And we will, we will want to then meet with the administrative team and go through those questions with, with that group and uh, see what ideas they have, any revisions they want to, to make to those questions so that we get their strong input. And then finally we come to uh, the full board, well, we would like to have uh, those focus group questions approved by the board. That, that the board understands those are the questions that we're going to go out and, and ask of those focus groups. And uh, it's, it's important then, everybody knows what's happening, it's no surprises, there's, there's, there's uh, uh, no uh, secret meetings, nothing like that. We want everything in this entire process always out in the open, strong communication going on so everyone knows uh, what's happening. Uh, back to the calendar then. Uh, in October, we'll begin meeting with those focus groups, gathering. Can I interrupt you just? Yes, sir. I'm a tiny bit confused. Okay. Um, the focus group questions. Yes. You described the process real well. The ultimate aim of the questioning, is it more... Um, I guess an open-ended to try and elicit what, well tell me what is it we're trying to elicit exactly? Sure. Uh, you know, you don't know what this blank slate, this strategic plan is eventually going to look like, or this, this strategic vision and direction. You don't know what it's going to look like. So uh, if this were a focus group here, we have a number of questions to, to, to ask about, uh, you know, what the, 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 uh, the current curriculum that's, that's, that's in, the, in the district. I, individual schools, uh, talk about those because we we'll probably do those geographically in the district. We want to know about uh, the, the facilities. What do the, what do the community, what do the staff, what do the board, what do you think about the facilities that you have? What do you, what do you think about the academic program uh, as a whole? What do you think about the finances of the district? You know, those kinds of questions will be, uh, and they'll be more specific than that because they'll be specific to the district. But we want people to really think about where are the priorities for them as an individual or a group for this district going forward. There could be some things out there that you don't know about, we don't know about, that have been really bugging some key people out there, that there's, there's this particular issue that, that we want to deal with. Maybe it hasn't even shown up in the survey that you did, who knows. 
uh, we, we want to take some of that survey information and expound on that with those focus groups to come back uh, to you with a compilation of data that says here's what this group thinks here's what this group thinks here's what this group thinks here's what these in particular individuals think um, and then uh, sit down with you and I'll go through the rest of this calendar but once we have that data now we have some work to do now we can roll up our sleeves and really figure out the kind of direction we want the district to go I, so uh, go ahead here also I'd like to add um, there is a good possibility that all of us in this room right now could come up with maybe what the key items are out there but what we'd be missing is the opportunity for input and ownership. So not, not only is the product important, and I, I realize that you've done a very extensive survey that has a lot of that information already, and you have other areas where you gathered it from your last bond election and so forth. But in order for these to not be your plans, that outreach is really important. Yes. It, 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 when Jerry mentioned the implementation of the plan, that ownership is the key to the implementation. If, if, if folks if throughout this community, as close or as far away from the operation of the school district, feel that they had some input into the plan, uh, whether it's indirect or direct, however it was, now they're going to pay more attention. They're going to want that plan to succeed, and they're going to have some ownership over it. So that, that's that's the idea: is opportunity, but also getting some information that none of us know might come forward that is is key to that plan. So it sounds like you're really focusing on what needs to be improved. I think we also need to gather information on what we're doing well. Yes. So when we, when we do something for improvement, we won't we we don't diminish what we're doing well. Really well. That's so right. Good. I agree with that, and I should have mentioned that. That that will definitely be a part of those questions that we ask. It's 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 because I I'll, I'll tell you for instance when uh, when I was an ESD superintendent, the three questions I asked of every school district superintendent every year was, what are we doing well that ought to be enhanced? What are we not doing well that we might want to uh, eliminate or improve? And what is it not we're not doing at all that we need to start doing? And so uh, I agree. You need to you need to uh, uh, bring in all of those kinds of aspects. Will the focus groups also be? I mean, gathered input, but will they also be kind of an educational type of thing for those groups? Because, I mean, just for example, we sit in, in our meetings and hear about you know, impl implementa implementations, <laughs> implications, mm -hmm. sorry, of like the Common Core standards and things like that. And that drives, you know, some of the decisions we make. Is that also going to be part of saying this is what some of the things that the challenges that the district has and that we're looking at. Yeah, it needs to be. And, that, and that's why those key documents are important for us to uh, completely understand what's going on in the district now. We know what's going on at the state level. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can bring both of those in into that kind of conversation. So yes, uh, we're hopeful that those groups you know, are willing to meet with us you know, for uh, an hour, an hour and a half or, or more. Uh, and, and put the time into that. Uh, by the way, I've always, I know Jerry agrees with this, we've done this before. If we schedule a focus group and we've invited people to come, and let's say only one or two people show up, we're going to spend the time with those folks. There, there's no question about that. Those are the folks that decided to come, those are the folks who want to be involved, and, and we want to hear from them. So we would never cancel any sort of <coughs> meeting if, if somebody uh, shows up. And we'll follow up and we'll get, we'll get crowds there. But I just want you to know how important we think that is for the opportunity that Jerry talked about is key. So just to clarify, I guess sure. just to sort of uh, follow up with Owen's question, we've done a, a great deal of work in some areas mm -hmm. over time, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the area of facilities mm -hmm. uh, and facility needs. And so we're not going to be starting all over. Uh, I mean, obviously we missed the mark with some of that long-term work, um, at least in my view, with the recent uh, results of the bond request. Um, but so it, it sounds a little bit at first blush like we're going to be starting all over with everything, and that's not the case. It's we're going to be case. building on what we and, have and already done. And we can bring up facilities. An right. example would be, we would say in a, in a focus group, 
the district's facility plan is X, Y, Z. This is what's been been carried out. This is what's in the future. <clears throat> how do you how do you respond to that? Uh, that kind of thing. So we're not starting over. We we don't want people to think the district wants to just start with a blank slate and, and and start over on everything. That's not the case. There's so many good things happening in the district, and so many things uh, that are already planned that are solid and good to, to go forward. The question is, is where are the priorities? Where are the most important things in the district? And to get those in place. Jerry's right when he says, if the budget doesn't follow the plan, once you have that plan in place, I'll say it maybe even a little stronger. Um, you either don't care about your plan or you have the wrong plan in place if the resources aren't following. So, uh, no, there's no starting over, David, I promise you that. Uh, but there will be adjustments. There will be adjustments, I can promise you that too. Uh, once you really hear uh, that strong data and you start focusing in on what you want to accomplish as a district with that laser-like focus, there'll, there'll be some changes. I don't have any doubt about that. I've never seen a process where there weren't changes. So I want to mention sure. another point. Board members may be thinking, well, this thing's going to really cost a lot of money. Think about all those hours and so on. We want as much of the district staff to do as much as possible. Uh, we don't need to be at everything. Uh, there's lots of data that we compile. Andy knows that he can call us at any time and there's no charge for that. Um, we, um, we want this also to be fiscally prudent for you. So uh, as much as we can farm out the work, have others do the work, which spreads the ownership, that's very good for us, and especially where there's data already there. Uh, the idea of plowing through that all over again and creating new, I'm glad you brought it up, because um, it will only help us, for us to be more efficient in our work, if there are things we don't have to do that are already in place. We also shared with Andy some real uh, money-saving ideas that we have. Uh, we're, you know, there are some consultants you hire, and you know they come into town constantly. They're staying in hotels. They're eating, you know, at restaurants. We have some ideas on how we can minimize all of that. So uh, we're going to try to uh, make this the, the best possible project you can have at the, at the least possible price. One of the lessons that I think we did learn, or anyways, at least I did, is that the buy-in of ownership, no matter how much effort we put out, and we felt like we put out a pretty good effort, I think we all did, in terms of um, investing our staff's time and Andy's time and our own time, you know, trying to, um, you know, doing some not focus groups, but similar type of groups. It, uh, you, you can't ever do enough of that. You really can't. Um, and also, I think, getting our staff buy-in throughout, you know, from the, uh, from the assistants to the kitchen staff to the teachers and all the way on up to have uh, those people be out there championing and working towards the goal uh, that seems to me to be a really a place where we should be focusing a lot of effort and, and it'll help future bond elections if we're able to do that it really will they're talking and they're voting. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and they're the contact that, that our parents and other people around, uh, around the community have. Sure. See, and, and, I, and I consider that a positive byproduct of the process. Obviously, the most important thing is accomplishing those goals and, 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 have, and getting the students to achieve. But it does help with the entire community's perceptions of the school district if you have a solid plan in place that they were a part of and they know where the district is going. It's, it's, it's really key. Uh, I'll try to uh, go through this. I have a few minutes left. Uh, in November, uh, we want to complete those meetings, gather that data, and uh, bring it to you. And uh, at that same time, we want to review your mission, your vision, your core values. Um, uh, and in December, we want to continue uh, that work. When I say revise as needed, that means if the board feels, or, or we want to recommend to you, but bottom line is whether the board feels there are changes need to be made uh, there, then those changes would be made uh, at that time. Uh, and we, we will continually point to the input that we've received from those groups as we're, being, as we're taking steps along the way. By the way, core values, just so you know, um, 
there's a there's a, a organizational development expert that's worked uh, for years in all kinds of line is core values whether they're written on a wall, whether they're published at, you know, in a newspaper, wherever, wherever they are, if they're not really the core values of the organization, they're meaningless. So you gotta get at what are your real core values, and if they're violated, somebody needs to get angry, because that's everything we believe in. How can, how can those be violated by anyone? Uh, so that's, that's important for you to remember. Uh, in, in January, uh, really starts to get very exciting. And, and if, if you think this work is exciting like we do, it's, it's, it, it, I think it's exciting. Uh, but the idea here is we begin to discuss the ideas for the overarching goals. Uh, uh, Jerry mentioned one goal, uh, that's, that's one possibility. Uh, I, I uh, agree there should be a small number of, of goals. Uh, that are again overarching and don't confuse goals with tasks and activities. We're talking about the overarching goals of the school district that would last for several years. And, and uh, you don't want to have uh, a whole lot of those where you get lost and, and, and it doesn't feel right. So that would be an exciting time. You as board members will be very involved in that process and it will be a fun, fun brainstorming kind of time. Uh, where we'll come up with some really, really cool ideas, and I think you're going to love that part of it. Uh, in February, we will uh, draft those uh, strategic goals, and that's the last part of that sheet, uh, the second sheet I handed out to you. Um, I won't read that to you. You can read that uh, later. But the idea is to come up with, uh, I'll say, one to five uh, <laughs> strategic goals. Uh, I think that, that'll be an exciting time for you. March, what it says there is probably uh, one of the most important components of this whole process. If you start reeling off those words and thinking what they mean, specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-bound strategies that will achieve your mission, your vision, and your goals. That's not messing around, folks. That's saying we are going to come up with the staff on identifying what are those uh, uh, strategies that we're going to utilize in the coming year. Not five years of strategies, but one year of strategies based on the overall uh, overarching goals. What are those strategies we're going to use to accomplish uh, our goals? And we're going to then work with the administrative team to identify what those metrics need to be. And that's going to be a difficult task for your administrative team. Because for years and years and years, folks in education and, and outside of education, in the private sector, everywhere, the first thing people do is come up with goals that there's no possible way you can measure them. Now, I'm sorry, not goals, met metrics. There's no way you can measure them. They sound good. It sounds wonderful. Uh, but uh, you want to have objectives with, with, uh, with measurable metrics that you can absolutely take a look at. The superintendent can come to the board and give you a report on where we are on our overall goals, uh, objectives, and, and uh, strategies. That's so important. So that time in April, that's why we put that as the only thing in April, is we've got to focus in on that time and what those metrics are going to be. And Jerry and I are going to say over and over and over again, they've got to be measurable. Uh, we will uh, meet with the board and administrative team, hopefully together, uh, to develop plans and tasks for 1415. Again, there's the same thing, specific, measurable, and time bound. Uh, that's key because if I'm out there as a community member and you've asked me for help on your plan, and you present me a plan, but nothing specific for my child for the coming year in 14, 15, I got a problem with your plan. So the idea here is, at that time, for you to present out uh, to the community, and I'll mention one step I'd like you to take there, if possible, uh, but you want to present out to them that, that not only is this our long-term plan, but this is what we want to do this coming year to really have laser-like focus and get at this. It's the most important thing we're going to be doing. Uh, in May, I would like you to bring together a key communicator group from, from this community and bring all of that to them 
and go over it with them in detail and get their input on it one last time, one last check, if you will, before you bring it back uh, to the board for a first reading, which would be that Silver Falls School District Strategic Vision Direction. That will be an exciting time coming to the board as a first reading. I assure you, every single person in this community will have heard about this process, will know what's going on by the time that comes to a first reading, and will have had an opportunity to participate uh, in some fashion. And the idea, the goal here is that you adopt uh, a plan at your June meeting, and uh, it's then presented out there far and wide to the community and becomes an integral part of what's going forward in the school district with accountability. Any questions, more questions on, on that process? I can tell you that process will result in an outstanding plan for you, I can guarantee you that. We've come to a part that you're going to take over the meeting now. Um, I'm going to give you two questions. And I want you to work individually on your answers to the two questions. And then we'll ask each one of you to give us uh, your input. And this is, um, this is really to educate Jim and myself on where you are right now. It's a kind of a scratch of the surface of starting to identify um, things of importance. And um, for an individual board member, I think uh, the answers can be very different based on your perspective and the time that you've been in the community, uh, on the board and maybe even in the community. Um, it's uh, a question that I used when I was interviewing for the superintendent position in the last district I worked for, the board said on your final interview, you will have an opportunity to ask us questions. I just want to let you know in advance. And I started thinking about that, um, and I thought, what, what could inform me most uh, from an individual board member of a question that I'd asked. And the question I came up with is one I want to ask you now. For your time on the board, what is the one thing that you were a part of that you're most proud of? So when you think back on your time on the board and all that occurred, what one thing would you pick out of that time frame that you personally, as a board member, are most proud of. And I, I'm going to give you the second question as well and then give you a little bit of time. I really find that writing uh, helps the thinking process, so that's why I'm asking you to write the answers down. So you know the first question. The second question is, what one thing do you feel is the biggest challenge for the school district between now and the next three years. The biggest challenge that the Silver Falls School District will face between now and the next three years. And then we're going to start with Owen and we'll work our way through on the first question till we get to Julie. Julie will answer both questions and then we'll start back down the other side. Going to give you about five minutes and uh, then we'll get started. Any questions on my two questions for you? So, the first question is the one thing that during our service we are most proud of that we were involved in. Yeah. I just want to be sure you entire <laughs> 10 year on There's so many things and it's been such a long time. 14 years? <laughs> yeah. 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. You've got, <laughs> you've got some time on your Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Okay. So this this will be interesting for us. Very interesting. Yeah. And a good kind of scratching the surface of priorities and interests. And John. Might be even important for Andy, although he probably can predict some of these things, I'm sure. <laughs>
are looking at the one thing from your tenure on the board that you are most proud of uh, as a board member? Well, that was a very difficult question. It is a tough um, question. Because I wish, like David, that I had a long list of, of accomplishments or things that I was most proud of. I haven't been on the board all that long. Um, but I'd have to say that uh, I was really proud of the effort and what I thought was a good um, a good process towards the facilities uh, planning. I, I thought that that we did a you know despite the outcome, um, I thought that we did a good job there. We we put in um, and, and despite differences of opinion and differences in the community, I thought that that, that was uh, well done. In our reading of the survey results, I thought that came up often, that people did see the planning and the effort toward that. Of course, there were some people on the other side, but yeah, I thought that it came through to me, that I appreciated that well done. Okay, thank you for that contribution. Tom? Yeah, um, I guess I'm most proud. I guess I'm, I'm the... If, if, I, if I understand right, since unification, I'm the first one from my local area that's been on the school board. Oh. And, it's been, and unless I, you know, misunderstand that and um, my history on that, and it's just been good to be able to bring some issues that I think were overlooked about the area to bring that to the board's attention. I think I think we we're I think I was um, effective in that. I would guess that the people that you represent uh, feel very good about your participation in that regard. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Well, um, I think uh, maintaining local control at the site level in terms of operational budgets and uh, control of their individual programs at the schools. So it's both budget and school governance, so to speak? Programs. Yes, yeah. programs. <clears throat> That's a big one. And uh, the local control issue did come up several times in the survey as well. Now that's an important piece in the community. Um, wasn't it you were 10 or 11 separate school districts in the early 90s? And, yeah. yeah that's, that's the point I joined the board. Yeah. <laughs> big, big item. That's right. Okay, Tim, we're on to you. Any on motions on that? One of my goals when I came on onto the board was to um, to work on building relationships with staff and mm -hmm. and I kind of feel like that's one thing I've been able to accomplish and I think that's been a real I think that's always a real helpful thing to get buy-in from people because if they know if they know who you are and know <clears throat> know what's going on they're more likely to even if they don't agree with the decisions you make sometimes they're more likely to, to buy in and accept them so right. I just kind of I'm, that's one thing I've been. And isn't it true that you do a number of school visits? I try to. Yeah. Yeah. For the the board chair to do that is really a very positive thing for the board as a whole. But, and uh, I think <clears throat> this thing that we're putting together, um, it's about relationships with the school district and the entire community and the staff as much as it is accomplishing goals. So that's. That's a really neat step. David? Well, I think um, <clears throat> there are lots of things that I'm very proud of, and this has been a, a really good board to work with. It's, I can it's sense been that. very, uh, we've had uh, great continuity, we've had very good people, we haven't had deep divisions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the <clears throat> one individual thing, I guess, that I would feel very proud of is. Uh, the school's climate initiative, mm -hmm. which is something that I actually worked on at Willamette ESD when I served there concurrently with my service on this board. <clears throat> it's not something that uh, came up in the surveys, but it's something that's kind of neat because it's become very institutionalized. Yeah. And it's Part of the culture. Yes, exactly. And we hear reports on it on a regular basis from the individual schools. And it's just neat to look back on this after all these years and see the way it's grown and the difference that it's made in behavior, citizenship, um, discipline, referrals, all of these uh, different things, relationships with the, the local communities surrounding our outlying schools in particular, uh, those kinds of things. 
differences in the culture at the high school. It's been a very quiet but very pervasive um, positive thing. So, great contribution. Feels good. Okay, Julie, you're up next. Um, I would say uh, the communication and being a representative of the community, the process of going through the bond and the process of hiring a superintendent, you know, to actually listen to when people were speaking and bringing some of their their concerns and stuff to the board, I just think that is a huge thing that you just open yourself up to really listen to what people have to say and then represent the people that, that you're here for. Yeah. Okay, that's representative democratic government, is it? And it's the communication level, you know, to keep it open. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a really powerful one. Herb, we'd like your success, please. Well, from what I can hear, it looks like you've got a camera on my pad. <laughs> no, oh. there's uh, several of them that the same thing. I feel like uh, I've been a good listening post to the community during the bond and before the bond on different issues that people would not feel comfortable coming to a board meeting, but if they see uh, in town or somewhere, they're willing to open up and I guess start. Oh, I've done a pretty good job with that. Okay, that is, uh, you know, there is quite a, there's quite a trend on this board about that community interface. I think that that is certainly coming forward as one of the strongest uh, positive feelings. Can you lead us off? Can you lead us off right now on what you would say you see as the single biggest challenge between now and the next three years for the school district as a whole? Yeah, uh, I think our biggest challenge at this point is what to do with Eugene. We've not taken another three, four years to rehash and rehash what we've already hashed out. Um, I think it's critical that we move forward, um, and but to be able to get the public to buy off on something like that, um, for them to understand how critical an issue the safety is for Eugene Field and for all the students and teachers that are there. Uh, that was certainly mentioned in the survey um, by a number of people. Big, big item. Thank you very much for that contribution. Julie, we're back to you again. Um, kind of piggybacking on that, um, communication with the community is probably the biggest challenge to be representing of what is wanted and needed in the schools and getting the accurate information out to the public. And I think that was another reason the bond didn't go through. There was just not quite as much as what was needed. So both the, yeah, I think that's really important to have that communication and to be very clear and very directive on what we need to do. Thank you very much. That we're going to start to see some consistency here. I, think. Yes, we are. I just wrote that uh, finding that elusive community consensus with respect to our facilities needs, which are very large. <clears throat> yeah. By the way, that, that survey for people like Jim and myself to come to you now really valuable work and there's a, a lot on that that we can use in this process but it's all already been done so we we really appreciate it and we'll plan on utilizing it Tim back to you kind of broad in general but my I think one of the I think one of the biggest challenges we face is um, with the increased standards coming down and the increased things that the kids have to learn at much younger ages um, Finding the way to best to best meet that for the kids and for the te giving the teachers what they need to get the kids where they need to be, and that you know goes around technology and facilities, and we have huge technology needs and huge facility needs. Yes. So it all relates to me, the student learning, and the best way to accomplish getting what we need for the kids to be successful. And, and, and it goes hand in hand with that strong communication. With the community Very much, because, yeah, because, because you have to have that buy-in. There's already uh, school districts in Oregon that, that, that started on uh, down the road with the Common Core 
uh, uh, implemented and the new texts are uh, being utilized as a pilot. And the communication with the community is, is so essential for what's going to happen to the baseline there. So if, what, that's a huge issue. To get them to understand, you know, before you have I drop out rate or lower, yes. you know, immensely lower grades. That's, that's right. That's right. Thank you very much for that contribution, Wally. Yeah, let me read the one. So this is gonna be kind of long-winded. Like <laughs> uh, I think if we just limited three years, and our our biggest challenge is, is uh, driving the higher-level construction needs opportunities, particularly around math and science, um, and particularly to our middle school age children. And then driving that on, on through the high school level, and then at a high school level, also providing uh, some occupational um, op opportunities of what, what can you do beyond besides college. We need need to have these kids meet meet our standards, very high standards that are coming. But at the same time, we need to recognize that all kids aren't going to go to college, and we need to have provide opportunities to them as well. It's, that's going to be one of the greatest challenges for the state as a whole. When you talk about 40, 40, 20, and less than 25% of the adult population in Oregon now have a bachelor's degree, uh, we better ramp up on, on uh, uh, career and technical education in a big way in this state if we're going to come close to accomplishing that statewide goal by 2025. Oh, okay, um, I put down just um, um, uh, unification, which you know, finishing unification. I think we're still kind of. Um, I've heard this term bantied around. Where we're, where are we? A school district or a, dis or a district of schools? Yeah. I think we're still a bit of a. I think we're still kind of operating as a district of schools, and we need to unify so we all feel like we're in this together. I think that's kind of was a lot to do with the bond. It was hard for people to vote for a new building for those guys yes. when we're still having an old building and we're bonded our capacity, our bond, bond capacity is tied up for the next 20 or so years, you know, so it was kind of it was it was hard to feel like we're all, we need to get to where we're all, all in this together. And you know, uh, when you try to bring 10 or 11 entities that have their own governance and yep. their own community and geographic isolation to some degree to the, say, district office, that, um, that particular item uh, may cast a shadow over everything here. And sometimes when things like this are not worked through, the other things can't happen. So yeah. it, I, I, I think that is a, a very, very big item, and I'm sure as we work with folks out in the field, we'll hear about any, any, any maybe advice or tire um, examples for more, because a lot of the unification was at the same time. From other districts are maybe farther along in that process than we are, I think could be helpful. Or, or, or maybe, maybe, maybe they're also struggling with it, I don't know. Oh, yeah. you know. Well, they're struggling with that. I, I had the pleasure of working in my career of being involved in the merger of four organizations and uh, you know it was difficult we got it through but there were hard feelings and there's ways that you can work through that to yeah. to kind of soften that over time but it takes time yeah and it takes good good strategies in place to do yeah. that yeah people everybody everybody i ran into you know this in the, in the whole district from one end to the other they all love their local schools in the area right. right and it's a it's a feature but it's also a bug yeah. So that's you, gotta, right. you got to work today. That's right. That's right. Jim, the reason I chuckled for just a minute when you were laughing was because I thought you were going to say you had to try to get 21 superintendents yeah, to be that, that too. Yeah. Yeah. ESD <laughs> that went all the way from Beaverton to Seaside. Uh -huh. <laughs> we had, uh, you know, 40 some thousand kids to 200 kids and everything in between. But we wound up working as a good group and yeah. it accomplished a lot of things. But uh, yeah, those those kinds of things are challenges. Those are similar kinds of things. Uh, but you've got to be have some sensitivity to all of the thought processes going around in, in that. There's, as you know, there's thought processes on the opposite ends of the spectrum. That you somehow you've got to bring those folks together. Oh, wait, we don't have the last word before we get to have dinner, so it's up. Okay, I'll keep it short. <laughs> I initially thought 
my initial thought was facilities, and then my thought was community relationship and communication, and then I thought about Jerry's concept of one goal, and I think where I landed was um, that those things are probably below the, the one goal, which I think Wally stated pretty well, in my opinion, mm -hmm. the educational uh, standards and our, our challenges for 40-40-20 uh, and um, ultimately getting our kids where they need to be there. And so um, I guess that's, that's where I land, and I think that those facilities are a major component as, as is implementation on a lot of levels. And it's, and, and all of that takes that community uh, component as well. Okay. Well, great work uh, for not, you know, thinking about this a whole lot prior to, I just introduced it to you 20 minutes ago. I, I've learned a great deal, and uh, I saw some good passion there, which we'd love to see. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Uh, Eric tells me we have food, but I don't see it. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, it might be easier to line it up there. Or did yeah. Denise have another plan? No, no, yeah. Denise said, let's put it out of there. And, uh, <laughs> so take a break and walk away from there, and then when you come back. It's <laughs> not a real long break because this is a working dinner. <laughs> so uh, we, Jerry mentioned, you know, we both have uh, other positions that we hold. I'm, I didn't mention that I'm the executive director of the statewide ESD organization, so I travel all over the state and work with those ESDs. But we're going to put those dates on our calendar and keep them sacred, and uh, so uh, we can coincide with, with, your, with your calendar. Okay. So like at our work sessions, this would be a topic of maybe like every work session amongst the other you know, other things we have. Today. That's our goal. Yes. Kind of sounds like it's all the stuff that we've been talking about. Yeah, a little bit more. It all focused. a little more focused. It all relate to a lot of stuff we've been working mm -hmm. on. When do we discuss what we want to take off our ta tables? <laughs> yeah. It's a good idea going into this process if we really want to do it well and have it meaningful that we consider that. It is because. If you don't, what's going to happen is the possibility of this being put off to the side. Um, um, and, and it just won't work that way. If, if this is really going to happen, it's got to be up front and center all the way through. And so early on here, the board has to decide whether you are ready to make this commitment uh, this, this year. So make sure you're no more in priority moving forward and, 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 and get this done. Uh, that, and that's, there's no right or wrong answer to that. It's just a matter of whether you're ready to do that. One of the agenda items tonight is 2013-14 uh, draft board goal development. And I think just that, Owen, would be a, a good topic for the six or for seven of you to have about uh, you know if, if, if you're going to be meaningful and, and as Jerry and Jim are, are saying uh, very purposeful about this agenda that this this would be one of the primary goals for the year uh, and maybe even limited your an annual goal to one or two you've historically had four or even five goals in the past and I, I would encourage you to consider this just being the primary one if there's a secondary goal then maybe for worth consideration but by no means should we, in my mind, should the board be considering four and five goals again with this on your plate and in, and in your uh, in your vision. Well, I was even thinking about our normal, uh, just our normal operations of our board meetings and our typical agendas. I don't I don't have much experience in in school boards. Um, this is really it. But um, I would, and I don't see a lot of fluff in our agenda that you know we'd want to cut out. But it'd be interesting to hear from some other folks that do have a lot of experience if they think that we're doing some things that maybe should be on lower priority, maybe we shouldn't do them. Or maybe, I don't know, I don't know what, we, what you see if you just took a 10 minute look at what we kind of do. Well, I, can, I can give you an example that, that I've encouraged others to do when you go through this kind of process. If 
and I say if because not all boards do, but if your board and your administration spends a lot of time on, on policy development and, and, and reviewing policies and approving policies. You know, that's something other than the ones that are required by law that you get into place, which don't require a lot of thought on your part because the statute says you will and so do you shall. And OSBA certainly uh, provides guidance there. But other than that, uh, my advice would be to put policy off to the side until you're done with this with this project because a whole lot of policy decisions that you would make ought to depend on the strategic plan that you have in place. And, and so that's one thing that you could say as a board, we can uh, put off on the shelf for a while. Um, you know, there's, there's if you look at uh, the kinds of things that you've done over uh, the, the, the previous year. I know, I'm sure Andy does this, uh, you know, when, when uh, I would put together a kind of a draft uh, board agenda for my chair and vice chair to look at, um, it, it, now is the time to be looking at those past agendas and saying, okay, those things that we have done in the past and we would be doing right now, we would be moving forward, maybe that's a list that can be made of things that the board can say, okay, this year we're not going to focus in on that particular item. These, though, we've got to do. We know we have to. But that kind of thing is how you can lessen your load as a full board and make this your top priority. And also using the consent agenda more. Yes. Where um, an individual board member could say, i sorry, I want this to have a full discussion and could take it off the consent agenda. But maybe more items could be put on the consent agenda with good background materials and there would be an opportunity still to take action and know about it, but not necessarily overall discussion. So much of the stuff we've talked we've been talking about the last year, you know, related to facilities and things, ties into all this anyway. That's right. <laughs> and I think with the outcome of the bond election and some things we we realize that we need to um, you know, just <clears throat> drill down more on some of this stuff and get into more specifics and, and more more communication with the with the community to find out what they will support. And so, I don't. I don't. I mean, I'm, this definitely adds adds a fair amount to our play, but the way it ties in with a lot of the stuff we've been we've been working on and the kind of goals we've been, been kind of working on anyway, or you know, looking for some answers. It, I mean, I can see us having longer work session meetings, but I think I sort of feel in the long run, it will decrease the amount of work that we're going to actually have to do, giving us some consistency. Maybe focus, 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 focus in a little direction. More. That's exactly right. I think you we know, become so diffused and so spontaneous sometimes that it's just, you're just <clears throat> mired down. The other thing you can do is the things that you wind up doing in the future, it will make for a much stronger implementation. And, and that you'll find out that that will happen. When you follow a plan, the implementation becomes much stronger. It takes so much, so much better in, with, with staff, students, community. There's a, a lot to be said about integration of the work so that there aren't separate pieces that are unrelated. Uh, I just finished a book called On China by Kissinger, and he said that in working with China, Chinese politicians over the year, one of the things years he found is he couldn't take any one single thing and get a decision made, because in the Chinese culture historically, things have to fit into patterns. There isn't something like, for example, Taiwan. We kept trying to get decisions on Taiwan, and they kept bringing Taiwan forward with a package of other related items. So as you look at uh, the strategic vision direction and your board meetings and work sessions, probably it should be a part of the whole and that the other items would relate to it so that there aren't separate things that have no relationship to the vision that you want for the district between now and say the next three years. That, that's a way of, uh, I think, uh, 
prioritizing and at the same time being able to make decisions based on what the most important things are. And it's not what we typically do. So going through this process, what I'd like to want to just do one more little uh, written exercise um, to give you a chance to eat also. <laughs> uh, but you have us coming forward. You've met us. We described the kind of process that we think we want to take you through. Uh, but what is it that you really want? What is it that the end, at the end of the day that you're looking for? That you will spend this money, you would spend your time, you would you would ask your community to spend its time. Oh, that's a lot of time and resources that you're you're saying we're going to spend. What is it at the end of the day that you want out of this? Other than just saying I want to plan. Really interested to know what is going to make you happy at the end of the day. When this is in place, and let's let's say three or four years from now, what's happened in this district is different than now, where you're going to say that was a wise investment. That's what I'm looking for right now. So take some time to think about that and write that down, please. Sir, could you hear that? I think I heard most of it. I didn't get the first part though. Oh, now I got to remember the first part. <laughs> uh, no, the, the idea is that uh, uh, after you agree that you want to spend all this time and resources, it, it'll be significant uh, with the, uh, the amount of time community members will spend, staff members will spend, you will spend, in addition to dollars you'll spend. Uh, why are you doing that? What is it, in other words, three or four or five years from now when you look back that would make you say yes, that was a wise investment. What is it that that, that you got done? Uh, not specific, you know, goals or anything like that. But what is it that that was accomplished uh, that you say, yep, that was money well spent? What's that? What's that end product? What is the what is the community look? How does the community look different? How does the district look different? How does it feel different? How does the board operate differently? You know those kinds of things. What is it that you're looking for specifically uh, in this end result? Okay. Settle, settle a number of contracts. <laughs> <laughs> On the right to settle, we're bringing side dish, and we. <laughs> That's right, we do see that. It's a direct relationship. <laughs> so, Owen, are you ready? I am. Okay, let's start with you. <clears throat> it's not going to be very measurable. That's okay. But um, for now. For now. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think what I want to see out of this product process ultimately is to be to move us a lot faster, farther down the road, so to speak. Um, you know, we've got right now plans in place and we've got some implementation, but I think that um, more laser focus towards those, uh, better implementation strategies, this process will lead to. Um, uh, hopefully a stronger community school relationship um, and ultimately I'd like to see us to be farther down the line in, in, implement, in implementing um, and solving those those problems and goals that we have. Great. I get that. Hey Dom. Hmm. Uh, 
I don't know, I guess the, the reason, the kind of the, the, the thing that prompted us here is probably the bond, you know, failing so bad. So we need we need to process that. We Essentially, we need to redesign the school district to sort of have a vision so we can apply. There were so many questions about the bond is how it is going to affect my school and how it operates and do we need technology in this school or not that school or whatever. We, we need to have a vision and a standard so that as we, it, as we decide to remodel the school or build a new school or do something, we have our standard that we want to outfit it for. And, and uh, uh, an educational model that we that we can all agree on and then when we come to issues we we apply we we look at our standard, this is what we want, and, and, and we go from there. Because I, I think we we're trying to make too many people happy last time. Yeah, let's see where That's the um, the plan would have the barn as one of the strategies in order to achieve the plan. Yes. So that they're not separate from one another, but they coexist. One depends on the other. Yeah, because we were early, because because we were we were starting as we were talking about the bond. We were still we were trying to define. We were talking about well, what do we need as far as science and stuff coming forward, and, and, and all these new standards coming down the line. Do we need to outfit our buildings with this bond money or not? We were, we were we were having all sorts of questions, and we just we kind of just stopped and we just said, "Nah, give us a bunch of money. We'll figure it out later." <laughs> I think I, I think that's kind of what it boiled down to. And as I was going through the uh, the survey tool and especially clicking down into the second level of of data, the question I had in my mind on all of those is who was. Which of those would have been answered already if you had this kind of a plan in place? And and for me, there were a multitude of those in there that, that I think would have supplied some strong information to the community if, if what you're describing were to be in place. But thank you. Uh, Wally? I think I may have gone down another five or 10,000 feet below that. No, that's OK. Um, so you, out, out in the future, what I hope to see would be an efficient operation, opportunities for students to learn at a very high level, and safe and secure schools. And at some point, uh, we're going to define what very high level means, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Those are all uh, important things, and I suspect that uh, all three of those, in, in some way, will wind up embedded in that plan. They have to be, because they're, they're so important. Tim? Looking five, <clears throat> five, you know, five years down there, like you said, and looking back to see if it was a, it was a successful plan. Right. It sounds simple, but it all comes down to me, increased student success, doing what's best for kids. And that's, I mean, that's why we're here. And that would be the measure for me, is if the kids are, kids are being successful. I love to hear that. That's, <laughs> if that's not the case, none of us should be here, right? Uh, I love that. David? Well, I think for me, it's <clears throat> very much like Tom's, um, a long range um, district educational and facilities plan that a clear majority of our patrons can support uh, almost <clears throat> from the beginning of the bond effort we started to hear that you, know, you guys have facilities plans but you don't have it grounded in an educational plan uh, for a period of years some people thought we should have a 20-year plan since the duration of the bond would be about 20 years others thought you know six eight ten or all sorts of different things but the message was the same you need you need both. They go hand in hand mm -hmm. in the minds of many people in the community. I really like your sentence that I didn't copy it down. Could you say it one more time? A, lo a long range educational and facilities, a long range district educational and facilities plan that a clear majority of patrons can support. Right. And that message there, when you read the survey. <clears throat> cover to cover, it's embedded in there. It's all through there. 
And, and something uh, that Tom said, and, and you applied, I think you agree with that. When you try to please everyone, you don't please anyone. And, and, and that's an important thing for you all to keep in mind is, uh, it, it, I remember, uh, uh, you know, things come back to you from years ago, but uh, one of the places where I was a, a, a principal, I <clears throat> uh, came into a staff and it was clear there were two or three staff members that were controlling everything. One of the guys I called Ponzi, when he put his thumb up, everybody, or he put his thumb down, and, and uh, I uh, immediately, a few of the staff members said, so, so what do we do now? And I said, I'm going to introduce you to something called significant consensus. <laughs> it means we have a significant enough consensus here to move forward with this idea, whether, didn't say this, but whether that guy has his thumb down or not. And, and um, when people realize that, um, you know, they may not get everything they want, but there, there'll, there'll be something for them in the, in the plan. They, they begin to accept it in, uh, to a greater degree. And that's where that, that the clear majority can support what is that. I think that's the holy grail. That's what we're looking for. Julie. Well, I would be, <clears throat> um, it's kind of thinking back on what people have said, but specific, specifics on how to, commun to communicate to be able to be able to talk to the community, inform them really well that there's no confusion where the money is going, or whether the school is closing, um, to have that community buy-in, to talk to them about technology and security. You know, what is our definite plan? What I mean, because people that was continually brought up, well, you guys don't have any specifics. So why would we get behind it just because? You know, they have to learn to trust again and to be part of. The, be part of the process and yeah. know the information. You know, whether it's real or perceived, um, if someone thinks that you don't have specificity, that you don't have a plan, that you don't really know where you're going, uh, it's hard to get behind that. And uh, you know, we always hear the joke as leaders, uh, man, it's embarrassing when you go to lead, no one follows. <laughs> So uh, the most important thing, right, is to uh, make sure that that group that you're working with, um, you understand them, they understand you, and yes, you've got to make some tough decisions along the way, but, uh, you know, I've certainly found over the years that even the most difficult of people to deal with, if they really believe they've been heard, not necessarily you agree with them, but they've been heard, it makes a big difference. But sometimes we write. Sometimes we write off those those folks. And I'll tell you right now, some of those people in, in a community, not necessarily yours, but I've seen it in other communities. Some of those people that the school district leadership have written off and won't deal with or won't talk to or interact with anymore. Those are the people that are out there at the restaurant at six o'clock in the morning with a group that they have, and they're and they're they're talking about the district and how they're not listening to us, and they're not working with us, and that builds and builds and builds, and we know that it, you know, for instance, it's, it's the secondary thing for me, but when there's a voting situation of any kind, if there's a question mark in someone's head, the votes no. Yep. Yep. So. Yep. Uh, it's it's so important, Julie. I, I agree. And we're going to talk about through this whole process the many ways in this day and age that you can communicate with your community. So many different ways, yeah. <clears throat> and everybody accesses it differently. So you want to get as many avenues of communication out there as you can. Okay. Is there, is there, is there gone? Technology has disrupted us. Oh, mm -hmm. a lot. Or, uh, maybe he's. Oh, you think it's back. Are you back? Yeah, Are sorry, I'm with my uh, jetpack uh, battery, but I guess I'll put it back in. <laughs> All right. Okay, Irv, you're up. Okay. Um, I think that uh, we need to be more progressive and aggressive in thinking outside the normal education thought process, if you will. Um, I think it was mentioned early on, uh, maybe some more vocational, educational uh, opportunities um, that uh, connects more students than we currently are. 
So, so uh, really thinking about what are those, what students out there we, we may not be connecting with and how can we think uh, differently than we thought in the past to bring those students in and have them really connected with the program to be successful, right? Oh, oh, I think we lost him again. It sounds like he's underwater. <laughs> <laughs> At least we got his contribution. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, we're at the uh, point now, Andy, where uh, we talk about uh, next steps going forward. We presented um, the kind of thing that's uh, the kind of plan that we think we uh, want to implement with you that, that we believe will work. And uh, so the important thing is, is that um, uh, after going through this uh, with you and, and hearing some of your thoughts, etc., cetera, um, uh, we want to make sure that we have direction uh, from the board going forward uh, with uh, especially next month's work, which is identifying focus group participants, uh, developing <clears throat> that schedule, developing the questions, etc. That's the next uh, kind of work we want to do. Um, and in and October, November meeting with those groups. So that's the first thing we need is um, uh, not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, a formal uh, kind of vote, but we just need to know that uh, uh, the board wants us to go forward with this, with this work. Uh, we're certainly ready to do that uh, if you believe the next steps are the ones that we've identified here. There may be other steps that you'd like us to take that we certainly would want to listen to. I'm in favor. I mean, this is kind of a straw vote kind of a thing. I, I mean, I'm in favor of that. Well, I think we need a, a process. <coughs> Excuse me. We have all kinds of information. We've had a, a really kind of a raucous and traumatic experience with the, the rejection of the bond request. And a whole lot of stuff has come out that we didn't realize or think about or understand as much work and planning as we did. All of this is in my view, of course, but, but I think that this process would really help us uh, to make progress. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. Um, you know, I, I try to look for the silver lining in the bond failure, but we, we probably got some of the best community input that we've ever had. Yeah. Right, everybody was talking about it. <clears throat> Now is the time to keep the conversation going. And you had a fairly high number. Yeah, very high turnout, didn't you? For 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 a local bond election, I think when there was nothing else on the ballot, I think it was extremely high. Yeah. So people are people are interested. I think that was, that's good. They're participating. They're, 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 I think they want. To, I think they want to keep talking. So they need to keep going. You know, just on that thought, I think in a positive way, you're going to have a large number of your community members that are not only going to be surprised that you're going after <clears throat> more input from them, but I think they're going to want to be part of that process. Hopefully, this hurdle. That was one of my questions yeah. <laughs> earlier on, like the focus groups and things. How do you get, how do you guys plan to get people involved in, in this process because I mean we had community meetings and we had for the size of our district we had 50 or 60 people show up we had multiple and, you know we had a lot of opportunities right. and people well I don't know I don't know anything about it I don't know what's going on so I mean how do you get past that if, if I were if I were designing this alone um, and maybe you know, some of you agree with this but I've used this kind of model in the past you do a two-pronged kind of thing we mentioned that we want to sit down with your administrators, we want to get information from you. Who are those people out there that we ought to be talking to? And we want to specifically invite them to come. When people are invited specifically, not through an email, but you call them up and you talk to them and you invite them to come, that exponentially increases the odds of them coming to this focus group. Secondly, to get massive kind of opportunity out there. Not necessarily massive participation. We hope to be great participation, but I know that I'd be in favor of 
dividing your district up into uh, natural kind of, of portions and say, uh, we're going to have uh, on this particular date and time, uh, this area of the, the, the community, here's where it's gonna be, at this school or whatever, uh, everyone's invited to come and participate. Um, so that way you have t very targeted groups that you want to have come and hear from, and then you open it up to whoever else wants to come uh, to, the, to those kinds of open focus for me. I think uh, that we're, we may not get huge numbers, but what we're trying to get is really good representation of different interest groups. And as Jim said, I, I think we've got you back. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> kind of like maybe an excavator cut the line between here and North Dakota. Or... Well, it's a good thing I'm in here. <laughs> so I know it's difficult by telephone now to reach people because cell phone numbers are not known. Uh, you know, you, you can't get those, they're not published and so forth. But um, I have found, as Jim said, that if you can ask a person if they would come to the meeting, the opportunities of them being there are much higher. So that might not be huge numbers, but it could mean that we get really meaningful dialogue from a lot of different segments of the community. And then in the last one I was involved with for an entire year, we had an opportunity for people online to register any comments that they wanted. And once a month, we would take all that data, uh, correlate it, and present it to the board as we were going through. So it kind of showed a trend line of what the community was thinking. Um, you know, I've had meetings where we've spent lots of time and energy, and uh, as Jim said, maybe only one or two people have come, and I think it's the modern lifestyle that uh, unfortunately has come upon us where there's so many issues and items and people are working hard and, you know, Joe looks over at his wife, Mary, and he says, Mary, do you want to go to that budget meeting down at the school district tonight? And she's probably going to say no, or he's going to say no. But at least we can have the opportunity, as Jim said. That's right. We don't want people to say we didn't have an opportunity for input, and we can try to get the majority of the interest groups and and really get some good data from those people who are willing to come in. The other thing that about inviting uh, the masses to come out to you know various ones, you don't it, it minimizes people saying, well, why wasn't I one of those ones that was invited to the targeted group? Uh, it minimizes that completely, uh, it, 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 and especially if you have the online feature that Jerry's talking about. Now, now you can have every single person in the community have at least two opportunities to uh, be a part of this, and then some who were invited could even be involved three different times. So never, no one would be able to say uh, with with uh, with any truth there that they didn't have the opportunity to be involved in the process, and that's so important. Well, you know, I think we had all that, except yeah. maybe, maybe the personal invitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, had, we had site visits, we had right. lots. We had, well, we had the personal invitation with respect to the facility planning committee, which was a large committee yeah. uh, <laughs> of public participation. But, yeah. yeah, that must be part of the reason, at least, why such a large turnout of people voted, because of the outreach that you, that you had. There's a lot of chatter out there. There's yeah. enough for confusion. Is kind yeah. of what part, of the, part, of the, part of the challenge, I think, was getting accurate information out to the people. Mm -hmm. out there, right? Because there was a lot of, with, with this phone, there was a lot of like, chatter going on. on the, it was yeah. amazing the rumors you'd hear. I mean, you know, we all heard rumors on the yeah. street that were completely unfounded. That yeah. Were, yeah. So there was a lot of that. And then to get the accurate <clears throat> information out to the people was. It goes back to your comment. This is the way to do it, I think. You, you yeah. gotta reach out. You gotta yeah. listen. Uh, and, and I think it would be helpful too if you have, you know, a couple of guys that aren't associated at all with anything that's gone on in the past or the present and 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 uh, have a chance to listen to uh, uh, them through an objective lens. And, and I think people uh, appreciate that and can see it that way. 
with the focus groups and you talk about you know key people and invited people mm -hmm. <clears throat> is it is it limited limited to that or is it something you would like go to each one of our schools <clears throat> and say we're having this meeting anybody who can come come well, that's what I, I mean that's saying. a lot of different that's a lot of meetings well what i was saying is do both do both i was saying i was, I was saying do both yeah. have, have your invited people to these particular groups and by the way your invited people include your your greatest supporters and your greatest <clears throat> critics uh, you want both there and and when you say um, you know when you had you know everybody have an opportunity to come to a meeting and, and listen to talk or whatever um, yeah you get information but I think the best information you get is from those key people in the community that you can really have a have a solid conversation with face to face get information there then you can get the other information from those larger <coughs> kinds of groups okay. so yeah we, we want to do both okay. when you do those personal invitations mm -hmm. would you have a suggestion in there when you're talking to them that they bring people that they think would be interested because then you got some people rallying for you to bring people that have that ever been part of it or does that get too big or I, I, I wouldn't want to do that uh, because we're inviting <clears throat> that person for a specific reason mm -hmm. that particular person mm -hmm. and and if everybody did that now you've got a large group that you really can't have the kind of conversation I'm talking about but you have turnout <laughs> uh, well yes but those people have an opportunity and we would say to those people in the smaller groups, please encourage your friends and neighbors and family to come out to you know the, the one that's that's generalized for, for everyone. But but I really want to have a chance to have an intimate conversation with people in smaller groups to say, you know, what is it uh, about this district? You heard you on? What is it about this district where you've got some real concerns? Uh, if you had to describe this district, uh, where you'd like to go, where is that? You know, uh, you can't have that kind of conversation with 100 people or 50 people or, or 30 people. We just can't do that. You need a smaller room. How many meetings would this do you envision this being? We don't know because we want to sit down, like I say, um, I'm hoping that um, in working with Andy, he can get ideas from you about who some of those folks are. Yeah. And then we want to work with the administrative team and see uh, some of those folks. And we're going to ask specific questions about, uh, you know, communities are unique, but there's a lot of commonalities. We will ask about specific types of people in the community. Who are those? And uh, how do we get a hold of them? What's the contact information? And and or, or have someone in your office contact them? But to me, what we want is once those people have been identified, what you want to say, and it'll go a long way towards getting them there. The board and the superintendent want to invite you to come out to this particular session. We need you. We we're we're, we're talking to. Uh, you know, a number of groups, and we want you to be in this group. Um, it's it, it's flattering when a person's invited to do that, and, and it's, it's a lot more difficult than sitting in the living room and saying, Hey, do you want to go to that meeting? Did you write here? The answer is usually no. But I have found when a person is aggressively invited, they usually don't say no, they usually come. Yeah, they'll say yes, and then they'll show because they're expected to. That's right. As well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And the number of groups really depends <coughs> on you. I mean, you know, we need uh, senior citizens, Hispanic community, and um, people who are um, business owners, and all of those different kinds. You know, you know the community well. You know what the groups are. You shouldn't leave any certain interest group out of. There's some real traditional ones, but I think that's a good exercise for you and Andy and the staff to determine um, what the different interest groups are and then if you know who within those would be representative. I think groups of 12 and below are about what we're thinking of. Right. And uh, I would also say none of these meetings are things that we wouldn't want you to drop by to if you wanted to. Certainly, uh, maybe sitting in the background of a certain interest group that you'd like to hear from could be instructive for you. So 
uh, we wouldn't see that they're they're closed to Andy or the administration or uh, or you folks uh, as well. But, and 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 if that happens, I've, I've been involved in, in those, and, and I encourage board members to do that same kind of thing. Uh, with a couple of stipulations. One is is that if you're there, we will introduce you because you don't want to be back in the shadows and they say, well, there was that board member there. We want to introduce you. Uh, and, and then hopefully you will not be very participatory. <laughs> uh, we want to hear from those folks, not necessarily you at that point. Uh, you may get asked questions. Of course, you want to be responsive. But uh, the idea is uh, we would introduce you as a board member who's come uh, here to listen tonight to what the community has to say. I think you can add on there, we don't, we don't expect him to participate. Cause, that's, yeah, that's right. Because I've been, I've been in those situations, they all turn out and look at me. Yeah. I'm here to listen to you. Yeah. We, we, I, I agree. With you. We'll, we would say that. We don't expect any participation. Board members have plenty of opportunities to participate, we would say. Mm -hmm. So you want you, you want to see groups of 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 of, of, uh, of interest groups? Yeah, <clears throat> you want to see you know no on the bond groups, yes on the bond groups. You would like to see yeah, so and, you get a group feel. Okay, and, and and what what Jerry and I will do is we will put together a draft kind of examples of the kinds of groups that that, that we might be looking for, and we, there's no way that we can come up with the correct list because you know your community. Uh, way better than we do so then we want you to either uh, delete some of those add to those as, as a board and then the administrative team and then if that can come back to us then we can uh, start putting those groups together and also your input on what key questions should be asked mm -hmm. so we'll ask the people <clears throat> I, I, I want to hi I, I, I spoke with the two of you about this and you've referred to it a number of times tonight and that's related to the, that, the engagement process that we did in the post bond and and we actually had the consultant from thought stream at the last meeting or two meetings ago and, and gave some very helpful information I, um, I I want to only mention that because I, I I believe it's a tool that could and should be used as part of this process and part of that is the fact that that they we have what did an additional opportunity to use them that came with the purchase of of the survey or of the engagement process so that's out there sitting uh, there for us but really uh, I don't want to necessarily give it a promo but I do believe there's an, an opportunity for us to use that here but what I do want to comment on uh, is related to your comment about the uh, uh, Jerry about the uh, uh, attractiveness of the, e the internet use and we sent out very few invitations with this engagement process but got the word out and had nearly 200 respondents uh, and, 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 and then allowed uh, for, for some very specific and I think articulate comments that in many ways were similar to what you would have in a personal engagement. You don't have the opportunity to interact. That's the missing element, of course. But it's 2013 and I do believe there is an opportunity for a tool like that to be used, uh, sending out a specific invitation. And, and keep in mind, we, we do have access to emails of, of all parents within the school district, uh, right. active with business owners, chamber of commerce. Uh, we have actually access to quite a few emails and can probably replicate a, an invitation that is pleasing to folks that they can take in, in, in an hour or 30 minutes in the comfort of their own home and I believe uh, gain some very similar information so what that looks like in all of this I, I guess I'm not quite certain uh, because I, I, I think the focus groups are, are critical and will we'll provide some very helpful information but it's a tool that I think can uh, we can access in some cases hundreds of more people that otherwise we may not have been able to yes that's right I agree it's, it's a really good opportunity for someone who doesn't physically want to come to a meeting but has some things to offer. You know. well, that's, that's the end of what we planned on sharing with you this evening. I guess I got one question because I know we're going to be asked at some point. This is all valuable, but what's the cost range we're looking at? Uh, we, we didn't, uh, you saw our contract, right, that, that we put in front of you. Um, we haven't sat down and, and had that exercise of what we think it, it, the end uh, cost will be. We can do that for you. Uh, we can try to come up with an estimate. We don't know, though, because of 
Oh, you, you, can't, you can't predict what's going to happen. I think it'd be helpful if you came up with the range, because I'm sure it'll be awesome. Sure, we can do that. that. I agree. Yeah, I think it'd be a big range. <coughs> just so we get we'll do that. that. Yeah. Sure. I thought you'd be doing it pro bono. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, such nice guys. <laughs> there, we, there we go. Well, it will be a very large range. Yeah. It'll be pro bono to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> pro bono to yeah. 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 yeah, we we can do that. I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, you it depends also, how many how many meetings we ask for you guys to have. We'll just yeah. we'll just estimate that. Yes. Okay. You also may want to talk with Andy, and maybe there's a bottom line that you have that would be instructive for us to say. You know, I can go along with this process, but if it starts getting up in this range, um, you know. <coughs> And then, so we, it can flow both ways. Yeah. yeah. Well, my sense is is that or maybe this isn't a sense, but the thought is is that it's not going to be a very helpful process if we put too small of a limit on it because you know the, the more meetings we have, that means that we're being in a way it means we're being successful in getting that communication to happen with the community. Um, I mean that's. And so it's, it's of course, going to be more expensive from that standpoint. And the more buy-in we can get, the more participation, that's going to increase the cost, I guess, in terms of your guys' hours and time. So I, I see that as you know, potentially a good, a good uh, thing. And, and I, I mentioned that you know, we have tried to take some measures, and we continue to do this, to, to mitigate the cost. And, and, and just a couple of those I'll mention. Uh, uh, my wife's parents live nearby here. I will never need a hotel room. Jerry will almost in a while, but but I won't because I'll I'll utilize that. If Jerry feels comfortable staying with my wife's parents, <laughs> uh, which I wouldn't ask him to do. Uh, uh, also, also uh, I work uh, a whole lot with folks in Salem, and if I'm I, I will try to schedule meetings when I need to be in Salem attached to this kind of work so then you're not having to pay for my mileage. So those kinds of, of, of ideas are how we're going to try to keep the cost down. One other thing I want you to know, I think we told Andy at the time, we dropped our uh, rate that we normally charge for this project because it's going to be so uh, much longer uh, than some of the other ones that, that, that we do. And we wanted you to you know, have a volume rate, uh, if you will. So we do want to keep those costs down for you. At the same time, you want to have a quality product. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll come up with an estimate for you. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Good. Okay, so we're going to take that as we're going to start moving forward. Okay. I would assume so. Yes. All right. Herb. Sounds good. Okay. I'm, uh, I need to say goodbye. I'm going to head over the pass before it gets too dark. I live in the north part of Bend, and I think I can get probably to uh, sub late before it's dark. So <laughs> I look forward to seeing you again, and of course, Andy and Jim and I are um, constantly communicating, and it'll be good to, for the three of us to talk after this meeting. Jim is going to stay. And so thank you again. Thank you very okay. much. Thank Thanks you, you. Have a nice drive home. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. This was really helpful. Very informative. Yeah, we're exciting. we're exciting. really looking forward to rolling partially using the new business. So. Yeah. Exciting. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to our other discussion <coughs> items. Review of board superintendent working agreement. We have all of this in our packet. It's one we've had for a few years now. Any discussion on this? Any thoughts? Does it look okay to everybody? Something to continue on with or 
Jim, it may, it sure. may be helpful to ask the board to to take a look at the categories uh, that we have in place uh, and maybe review each category and see if there's something there that they would like to have considered or, or modified or removed. Okay. Uh, and, and I and I do, I didn't have them prepared in advance uh, for this draft, but I do have a, a few that I'd like to bounce off of them just for consideration okay. and at least for discussion. Yeah, so. chime in anyway. Okay. 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 Um, governance policy principles. Anybody have anything on this one? And Andy, just jump in wherever you need to. Sure, you bet. Meeting operational agreements. Anybody have anything on that part? Uh, back to, to governance uh, to principles, Tim. Uh, um, I'm curious if, if the board feels comfortable, uh, especially uh, related to the specificity of number two. Uh, and and I, well, I think that you, you understand that. I, I, I just want to be certain that uh, you know if there is ever a distinction that needs to be made about what what my role or Eric's role or, or staff member's role is, administrator specifically, as compared to your role in the day to day operations, that that, that, that be uh, sorted out or at least have a principle to help best address that. Does this provide the specificity that that you need? And, and, and I believe you're a very good board when it comes to referring things to me when it comes to operational needs or I guess we're talking about governance here specifically, but when, in distinguishing what is uh, specific to the superintendent's role as compared to the board role, or is, is there any distinction that needs to be refined in that arena? Are you comfortable with it? I'm comfortable with it, but okay. it's fine. <clears throat> Is there anything you think? What are you hinting at? <laughs> What's that, Julie? I said, what are you hinting at? What are you? Well, no, I'm, I'm actually not not hinting at, at, at anything. I just, uh, as we, especially as we move ahead, and you know, and, and as I think David alluded to, we had some a few hot button topics that we had to address last year, and, I, uh -huh. and just being certain that y you're comfortable in everything from uh, the process of of. Um, uh, chain of command uh, and what that looks like and that I'm uh, uh, responding appropriately to the needs that that you hear uh, and and referring to the correct person or that uh, those topics are being brought to your attention that you feel need to be brought to your attention as well and so if we're comfortable there I am Julie right. I just want to be certain that you have the conversation about it yeah. Everybody okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Meeting operational agreements. Nothing. Andy, did you have anything on this one? I, uh, I, I guess I, maybe Tim and Wally, this is more specific to you, and I heard Jerry and uh, and Jim refer to this a little bit tonight. Uh, the, the the agendas are are crafted um, drafted crafted by by me based upon what I believe are the needs of the board at that time based upon input from the previous meeting so while we don't have a sit down of Tim and me sort of crafting the entire agenda I believe it is a reflection of what the board wants uh, and Tim has of course the opportunity as chair to to revise that as appropriate and has on occasion as has Wally when he's been the chair in the past uh, the one piece that is that we don't have though that I have noticed in other school districts is that prior to the meeting and all of you know this that the board chair and I meet the week prior to each meeting is uh, many school districts have the board and assistant chair meet uh, and so it's three you know two representatives from the board uh, and meeting with me to to discuss the agenda discuss topic process and so forth there may be some merit to that of course it's coordination of schedules and all of that but I have heard that many school districts do that and it's a positive it's a positive uh, 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 response to Wally, you know that kind of falls on your shoulders this year as assistant. We can surely do that, and whether it belongs in an operation, or excuse me, a working agreement or not, I, uh, maybe that's worth the discussion. But uh, it has been included in others. I'm certainly open to it, but I don't know if it's necessary. Okay. I think we have a very efficient agenda, and uh, we can go with Tim if we need some added. Yeah, whatever. I'm open to anything. Doesn't matter. Okay. 
and, and I'm not here to force your hand one way or the other. If you're comfortable with what we have, then that's that's fine with me. And that's true. If anybody has anything they want on, you know, either contact Andy or me. You know. Okay. Okay. Communication <coughs> agreements. Anything on this one? I have a question about number five. What's the kind of parameters there of, uh, that we're thinking about in terms of limiting a response? I assume this is this is not talking about board meeting communication. This is talking about communications in the public. That that's correct, um, Owen. And, and obviously, you're you're speaking as a. While you're an elected official in that circumstance, you're you're speaking as a member of the community, essentially, because you, you're right. not speaking on behalf of the board. Right. And so I think that that is sort of a, a cautionary statement, as much as anything, to understand that uh, the conversation of board members should should have that lens in place that. You know, rather than specific guide or saying, oh, yeah, we're going to get there, we're going to do that, or I'm going to convince the board to do that. I think that's uh, that's the caution of that statement. And then, of course, the employment-related concerns are, are uh, legally bound. I um, do have a suggestion, though, and I, I don't, I couldn't find it in here specifically, uh, and, and, and it, it's a good reminder for me, but that is when, when, when a board member asks me a question uh, via email or, uh, or, um, uh, or, or personally, uh, I, I, um, I think it's, it's very helpful for me and actually a responsibility of mine to be certain that the rest of you know that that question was asked and here is the answer to that question because you're operating again as a unified board. So if I get a question from a board member, I'd like you to know that that question I'm going to share with the rest of you and and, and my response to that, <clears throat> to that question. And I've been providing weekly updates to you at least you know, every other week as I can. I think that's a nice addition to our relationship and I can include those in those updates that I provide to you. But, but I think... Um, I think that's a, a reasonable expectation for me to have, and something that I'd like to have included in uh, uh, in, in the working agreement, if acceptable to you. Yeah, sure, I think that's the general practice anyway. It is. Yeah. By, by the way, those weekly updates are great. Yeah, I, I agree. really appreciate them. Yeah, I know, I know it's bet. a little bit of a burden for you, but yeah. it's very helpful. It's all about the system. Once you get it established, <laughs> it works fairly well. That's right. uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're welcome. I, I, I I'm glad I'm doing that. And then back to number five, I'd like to change the word can to should. I don't like the connotation that can has in that sense. If anybody else read it, read it that way. But part of our role is, as a board is to, is to listen to the community. Yeah. We're, there. We're your eyes and ears. Yeah, that'd be fun. Okay. Right. We all would look, we, I don't, I don't, I don't, not too many of us say none. <laughs> 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 I think that's the spirit of what that signal is shooting. <clears throat> and Andy, did you want to add a, a number nine related to questions the board? Yes, I'll, I'll put that in draft form and send it out to you prior to the next meeting. And, and then we can approve this at our next yes. meeting. Yes. <clears throat> so overall, is this document the one that we've had in place? It, it's some time or has yes. it been recently reworked? <clears throat> no, we, it, it's, it's essentially uh, the same doc, uh, document with a couple of changes over the last uh, about two or three years, uh, David. So it, it hasn't changed much. Three years, I think. It was crafted through templates from OSBA uh, at the time that it was crafted. I also sought input for some other superintendents who had sort of been in the trenches for a while, and, and so some of the modifications at that time were there. But um, uh, I, I, um, I don't know how common uh, this document is. And in, in speaking with Jerry and Jim, it sounds like there are m m many school districts where it's not there and 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 so i'm pleased that we have something in place because it is a document that i think at times especially if there is a uh, 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 either a difference on the board or a difference between the board and and me or if there are questions of resolution similar to what we're doing with the visioning process this is a document that we can refer to and, and ground us in decision making and <coughs> the reason i ask the question is i 
I'm not so familiar with um, working agreements between the board and, excuse me, I'm full of dust as usual, and the uh, superintendent. But I, you know, um, at OSBA, for example, we have the board working agreements, which are basically the working agreements between board members about how the board will conduct uh, the business of the association in its governance role. So this is a little bit different, it being specific to the superintendent. But, um, well, David, that's a great comment because really this is an it's kind of. Uh, and is an agreement amongst the board members. A lot of the a lot of the uh, yeah, provisions anyway are exactly. Um, yeah. In it's addition just to this, it's just set up a little differently mm -hmm. than what I'm thinking. I think maybe that just by <coughs> uh, tweaking the title a little bit, their agreement amongst the school board, mm -hmm. and you know, you just kind of change the title of the parties, something like that. That's a good idea. It covers all both areas. Can you work on the title, Shane? Dan? So, so Owen, I, I, I hear you. It was I think I hear you saying it's a working agreement amongst the board uh, between These certain provisions are between the members of the board, you know, and how we deal with say things like division and uh, the one, you know, one of the most important. Um, you know, we're agreeing with each other that we're going to arrive at the meetings, okay. for example, and having read and be prepared, not just agreeing with you. And then, um, you know, number six, uh, meeting operational agreements. You know, that's a huge one, but uh, making decisions as a whole, recognizing that, uh, uh, that no, not number six, um, number seven support decisions of the majority after honoring the right of the individual members to express. So those are really, my, my thinking, those are agreements amongst us about how we're going to behave. And okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to think uh, out, out loud now of maybe what it could be, you know, working between, 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 yeah, between the Silver Falls School District Board. You could say amongst and between the Silver Falls. Amongst and between. Or something or something some kind of language like mm -hmm. that, yeah. Right. Oh, those are very good points. I mean, I agree because many of these agreements are between each each of you, aren't they? Okay. Okay. I can craft something and send it to you, Tim. Uh, yeah, board plan. Okay. And the last topic: annual planning and evaluation. Anybody have anything to add or take away about this? Good? Yep. Okay. Okay. I'll update those and get a key for your September meeting. <clears throat> School plant facility planning and funding. Number one, you said you did feel school. Andy, do you just want to put something in? I put a working document in, in front of each of you and have provided it for members of the public uh, tonight as well. Uh, the, um, and I'd like to spend a few minutes and, and go over those with you and then seek your seek your input related to uh, next steps and, and I, I think it's important that you know in in light of the conversation that you've had tonight with Jerry uh, and, and Jim and I and I think this is valuable and I think it's smart uh, that uh, your your facility planning um, discussion to be be included in light of your visioning process and your strategic planning that you're carrying out through through the course of the next nine months or beyond uh, so with that said however uh, I, I provided you a, a document called Post Bond Review and Draft Action Plan for board discussion in uh, early summer, uh, and it was it was an outline of, of what I believed, and I think I heard consensus from each of you to specific to what what the next steps should be related to facility planning. And, and again, what I heard from each of you is that our facility needs are, are not going away. We've done a reasonable job of defining what they are uh, and whether they're uh, uh, the reasons for the bond failure and the reasons, uh, uh, or, or excuse me, the direction that you need to take and we need to take as a district uh, are maybe yet to be determined and refined. The fact remains we have a variety of facility needs. And so as you go through that, that that list and, and uh, the, the flow chart really and, and moving from top to bottom focusing your attention to the, the, the five boxes on the bottom and there may be others uh, which 
is why I put others in the bottom right box. Uh, I, I put what, what I believe were the main elements that were contained within the facility and continue to be contained in the facility plan and were elements of the bond. Uh, and, and at the last meeting, I, I also put a, a red box next to continued use of Eugene Field. And that's not a statement of continued use, it's a reference to continued use of Eugene Field. Question mark, period, take your pick. Uh, and about what that, what that, that looks like. Uh, and I consider that to be a priority distinction because in, in my mind, and based upon what I think I've heard from you and what I know I saw uh, on the engagement summary, is that uh, people who voted yes on the bond were, were supportive partially because of the need, their, their interest in either getting out of Eugene Field or seeing something done uh, differently due to circumstances around that school. But what I also read within that engagement uh, summary uh, and, and what I've heard from folks in the community as of you is even people who voted no, uh, I, I believe that there's a general sense of concern about Eugene Field. Now that doesn't mean uh, that those people are necessarily have the, the solution to that, but I think what there is agreement on is there is a sense of general concern. That extended into the conversation at the last meeting where I heard from, from many of you, uh, or from or all of you, uh, all right, what does that mean and, and where do we go from here with, with uh, in relation to Eugene Field. Um, uh, Tom, I think you were very thoughtful and specific in your comments to related to what, what are the fatal flaws and what's really, what's wrong with that building uh, and, and what are some of the elements and, and not, not necessarily fatal flaws just structurally, but I think fatal flaws globally and generally as a school. At least that's the way I interpreted that, or at least I'd like to influence you to consider it that way. Uh, and, and David, I appreciated your sentiments specific to sort of through the lens of the new economy, I think was your phrase or something to that effect. And I think that's I think that's spot on as well. I mean, we, we uh, uh, so even with those those two reasons and the other concerns, maybe a little bit more traditional or, or what we've heard, like. It's a 92-year-old building, and it uh, doesn't have the square footage we want, and that it's locked in between two two-lane highways, etc. None of those, I think, are to be minimized at all. Uh, and so, what I what I've done is on the second page of, of your document have crafted for discussion only for the board. This, by no means, is is a final document. In fact, I, I suppose it's more of a, of a proposal than anything that I'd like to move ahead with, but I'd like your input in doing so. And that's specific to, all right, let's, let's dig deeper into that building and, 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 and what, is, what does that look like? And as you read through these, and, I, and I'm going to read them uh, out loud for the sake of the public as well, uh, I'll make a special note to say that the majority of them are not necessarily related to this, the, 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 the specific structural facility. Even though uh, a couple of them are, there are some others that I think need to be addressed. So, so first and foremost, I, I believe, at least in my mind, I'm rec recommending that, that uh, as soon as reasonably possible uh, that we uh, establish um, a task force, not a large one, a small one, uh, seven to ten people, give or take, uh, with the specific goal of, of identifying the the, uh, the concerns specific to Eugene Fields School. Do we already have that information? I, I, I don't know. T task force just seems feels to me, with the exception of involving more people, that we're just spending more time. Like the same information we already have, and, and maybe so. Well, let me let me explain this a little bit more, and, and uh, I, you know, clearly I'll follow the lead of the board on this. But I, but I do know that one that, that a couple of things that, that we haven't done in my mind uh, satisfactorily, specific to that building. Yes, we have looked at it structurally. The Skanska report that we did last year. Uh, I, I think uh, we can also dig a little uh, a bit deeper uh, in, into the structure itself, especially specific to what uh, some of the fatal structural flaws may be. I mean, I. Uh, I think it's been a while since somebody poked around the, the footings of the building and maybe tried to put a metric, say, specific to what the level of dry rot is in the building and things of that sort. I think there are still some, maybe some unknowns about that simply because we haven't drilled a few holes and done some invasive testing. I think some invasive testing is likely necessary uh, to that old building. I, I, again, I'm, I'm going to follow your lead, but, I, but some of the questions that we heard uh, uh, even though there was general sentiment about getting out of the building was also specific to what are some of the problems with that old building and, and I wasn't able to answer each of those questions because we haven't dug that deep. Um, but but yeah, I, yeah, and can, and I, I, I just want to ahead. elaborate yeah. a little bit on when I say fatal flaws, it's, yeah, part of that is structural, but just you know, the, the other things that just make it, you know, why is this building no good now? Can we, 
or can we keep it going for 10 or 15 more years, that kind of thing. It, it, it's not, as I look out there 20 years down the road, I can't see Eugene Field there. It's, 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 sure. it, it's a bad spot, but can we keep this going for five or 10 years or 15? Or, and balance that against what are the fatal flaws, you know, location, health, uh, structural, you know, you know. Are there some cost-effective alternatives out there? Yeah. I, I think I think there are that mm -hmm. that even if we found some if we drilled some holes and found out dry rot wasn't necessarily as extensive as we think think it is, it doesn't mean we shouldn't move out of that building. Well, while I agree with you, I I, I think uh, I think some of those are the answers that I can't provide and we can't provide as a district right now. And, and uh, uh, then is the task force needed for that, or do we just need to hire a contractor to go out? And what? Somebody's <laughs> party. Just turned off the lights. I, uh, I, I, I think hiring a, a, a contract to do a little you know, dig, deeper digging in there is is, is warranted. Uh, and, uh, but I don't know. I'm not certain that a contractor can also help uh, define uh, some of the short. And in fact, I know a contractor can't. Some of the short and, and long range concerns, even if it's ten years out. What's what's the, what's the limitations related to uh, uh, programming of the building? You have two significant special needs programs in Eugene Field in three classrooms, and, and what's the anticipated growth of that and the impact okay, in the building uh, over the next five to ten years? Uh, uh, enrollment. This is a, an interesting, uh, uh, I think, comparison that, that a committee can dig a little deeper into, and that is that that when you think about the impact on education of of students that have essentially 90, maybe 95 square feet per student of, of instructional space as compared to most other schools in the district, which have anywhere between, say, 110 and 150 square feet per student. What are the implications of that? Uh, and, and are you willing to live with that for the next 10 years while we figure out something else to do? Uh, uh, other, others, I think, that need to be considered would be what are some of the other you know, limitations or, or allowances even in the building, especially limitations that you have. Uh, while, while I think we're all aware of it, uh, the the there, there could even be discussions about access to education and, and what the school can't provide currently with its limited parking, with its limited um, uh, playground, uh, with some safety hazards in the building that we have identified, and what does that mean? Uh, the inefficiencies of the building simply because there are, are, are limited restrooms for students' use and what that impacts on, on the day. I, I just think a little bit deeper digging committee conversation about that, bringing back to you with maybe even something like Thomas would envision whether the committee could do it or not, maybe a different story, would be option A, option B, and option C. And, you know, and maybe a, a, a continuum with, with option A, let's sink another X number of dollars into it and get five or seven more years out of it. Option B being, uh, you know, let's figure out what kind of, uh, uh, what, what we can do to either get out of it or at least make some significant modifications to the building. And option C is, get out and then use yeah. those because again what I heard from the community is give me some options give me some choices so I better understand what the circumstances are at Eugene Field and have a better feel for what those needs are and I think if we can get a group and this is, would be a group of balanced minded people I don't think people should be on there uh, who have a, a, a purpose of 100% drop everything, you know, we need to uh, get out of there and build a brand new sparkling school, uh, or nor should we have anybody on the other end who, who will say, you know, that school has another 50 years of life left in it and we can make it work. I think you try to find a balance of people who have that, that scrutinizing lens to be able to identify what are the limitations, what are the allowances, and what could it look like for just a few years to as much as 20 or 30 years. So it sounds like you're looking for a group that's very familiar with that building already and, and educational needs of students. Yes, they should have some educational so needs. skill set that... And I think we have people who are on the Long Range Facility Planning Committee, Wally, who, who could fit that bill. Uh, I, I won't mention any names out loud here because I haven't asked anybody yet, but I do have two or three, a couple of former educators okay. who, who can see the big picture perspective of, of Eugene Field. And honestly, I, I think now, especially in, in retrospect with the, with, the, uh, with the bond, I think we owe it to the community as well to be very clear and uh, transparent in what some of the concerns are uh, related to Eugene Field School. Well, I, I agree with everything that you said, Andy. Um, 
I think that we have to have a, a look at this, an objective, uh, sort of comprehensive revisit of the issues. I think one of the things that I picked up um, in my experience with the bond, <coughs> I'm really sorry, it's that season, <laughs> allergies and dust, but um, is that there's some distrust um, about the, the, uh, the repeated process over time by which um, we have developed this mindset that we have to get out of Eugene Field no matter what. And it was developed in the minds of some at a time when we had sort of this ever-increasing prosperity and um, the expectation that if we wanted a brand new school, we would have a brand new school, no problem. Uh, I think, you know, in my view, once again, things have really changed and they're likely to stay changed uh, for the long haul in terms of our lifetimes. So I think one of the things we really need to do is have an objective, comprehensive review of Eugene Field. And I think um, it's really important that we have not the same people that have been on the previous task forces that have basically condemned Eugene Field, but we have uh, new people who take a fresh, objective look at the feasibility of staying in the building, as you said, option A, or, you know, different options. The feasibility of retrofitting the building, maybe changing its use a little bit, uh, perhaps modifying attendance boundaries to take some of those students out of the Eugene Field, if necessary. I mean, I just think that we need to revisit this in a comprehensive way, and I think that's the only thing that's going to quiet the, the critics or lead the district in a new direction with respect to Eugene Field. So that's just my two cents. I have that sense, too, that, there, that, that part of the purpose here is to serve is to have a fresh group that is ab above mm -hmm. the appearance of even a reproach, that there's no, you know, they're not in bed with the board or the school district in some way. Um, and I know that if we're inviting people, there's always that, that um, you know. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so that I, I see that as being part of the value of this, is if we can get some folks on there that are known in the community as, you know, free thinkers and objective and qualified, competent people. Um, and it may be that, that they will um, advise us that they need some additional information that a contractor could provide, you know, inspection, um, digging, you know, whatever, as they're going through the historical documents and the things that we've already done. If they then identify, hey, we, we want somebody to come in and do A, B, C test to, because these are areas of concern, we need more information, I could see it working that way potentially. Um, but I can think of a couple people in the community that are are, um, I mean, they're certified building experts. One, one, two guys are, are guys that have been superintendents for years in companies that build schools um, and do remodels and things like that that are, are well known uh, in the community. So I think I think we could find those kind of people, and, and that also aren't, you know, probably wouldn't be seen either as being, um, you know, people that were just directing somehow. And I, I think at the end of the process process, we, the board, needs to be decisive as we can on a direction. <clears throat> we need to plant our flag and stick with it and make a decision. That's one of the comments I've heard is that you guys just talk, meet and talk all the time. Never decide that we need to make a decision and take our lumps one way or the other. Um, and Tom, are, are, have, do I hear you saying that, yeah, that this well, is... Well, the, but the public did didn't agree with them, you know. I mean, our, our plan is to keep going for five more years, and if we can't get a bond to replace it, we're going to go to modulars and cut funds. You know, that's that's our plan. If we can't get a bond, I mean, that's that's what we're going to do. Something like that, or in ten years, or twenty years, fifty years. I don't know. Or we're going to we, modulars next year. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know, make a decision based that's on just, some good. Yeah, and at the same time, well, I think this is probably a good idea, even though we may not necessarily need more information. I, I don't, but <laughs> yeah. But um, I don't think we need to. Dra I don't think it needs to drag on for months either. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's something we need to. I think we need to decide this year what we're going to do with Eugene Field because, pers I mean, by my personal opinion is we need to get kids out of there, and we need to come up with some other kind of plan, whether we pass a bond or not. We need to figure out how to get kids out of Eugene Field. That's what we have a plan this year. And um, year. 
And so while I think this might be a good idea to you know increase involvement and get a little more community buy-in, I don't I don't want to, I don't want to see it drag on. I think we need to I think we need to make a decision yeah. in the next few months even I agree as to that. what to do with Eugene Field and if we're going to stay in it or if we're going to move modulars somewhere and as a you know kind of temporary fix or whatever. I just think. Later. And I want to, after we get done talking about Eugene Field, there's a couple other things I want to throw out there because I think there's some <laughs> things we need to start moving ahead with and find money to do it. So, but that's my thought on Eugene Field. I, I mean, I, I can see the benefits of this, but I don't, I don't want it to drag on for months. I think we need to make some decisions and decide where we're going to go. Some of the things you talked about make sense, but a lot of stuff around these bullets, I think we already have. But if you're talking program level, I, I, some new details. I, you know. I, I, and I, go ahead, Julie. A lot of people were looking for more specifics why we're opposing Eugene Field. I mean, they know. They know the basics they, that's out there. But at the same time, you know, a lot of the questions I was hearing is, well, what does it really take to get it up to code, to get it to where it is safe for the kids for earthquakes? You know, what can we do to drop off, whatever, to make it safer. What What is what's really happening here? Are you just throwing it away? And, you're, and the other comment was, you know, you're just moving into the school you just moved out of. So why would you go over there? You know, and so there was some, but they were looking for more specifics, very specifics of, you know, well, why can't you fix it? You just say it's bad. And it is. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with any of that, but the specifics of you know, what does it take to get it to? Look for data. They are, that's and and whether it's what, technology or security. That's what a little bit of some of this could provide, I think. And, and they're looking for the source of the data. I mean, certain element, anyways, is looking for the source of the data, and I understand that certain element always feels there's a mistrust of the source. But that's why I think, like David said, you know, he's a fresh people that can be the source, or that can at least vet the material that we have and present it. Um, well, it's reliable. <clears throat> That's what I was trying to say in my own wheezy way this evening. Is I think that we've never taken a look at an honest, objective look at what it would take to fix the building. The mindset has always been it's an old building, we need a new building. Uh, the economy is such that we can afford a new building, um, so let's just throw that one away. And I, I think that that's really important information to a lot of voters, at least in, once again in my experience. So, so, so to supplement that comment, sorry to interrupt you if I did, David. Yeah. To supplement that comment uh, is, uh, and actually to take it to the next step, is that if, if there were a solution to remediate that building, the, the next step is, the next question, one of them anyway, would it, would it hold 500 students? In other words, we have, a, we have a school by 2013 standards that has the square footage for about 300 students. So if we were to remediate the building, if we were find that that's the best course of action, then I, I think that you as a board have an obligation to ask yourself the question, then what do we do with the other 200 students? Or, or where does that, and, and this group of people could help surely uh, bring that to the surface and, and discuss that with the public as well, because it may not be smart instructional practice to put 500 students back in a school that really should only have I mean, can it be equipped to to educate kids the way they need to be educated? Correct. So um, we should look at what the cost of that would be. Mm -hmm. The answer to that is yes, but it's going to cost money. And to get the, which I think where Julie was heading, it's going to cost some money to get, if you want really concrete data, it's going to cost us money to get that. Well, the, you know, the bond went really fast. It, I mean, we got it out there and put it out there and had a lot of information out there, but it was too quick that people weren't processing. I think if you make, you know, a decision in the next two to three months, I think you're not going to have um, the population buy-in, you know, the community buy-in. And that, that is going to, that's what hurt us so bad in the bond is that we, you know, they didn't feel comfortable in them. I think people are pretty comfortable with closing Eugene Field to a point, but they need more specifics before they're really behind it. When you, you look at the voter, the voting um, group that represents the kids that are in Eugene Field, that group was in favor of the bond. Um, it was really the outlying people that, you know, you, I think unless that building probably is falling down on top of the kids right now, they're probably still going to vote no. Um, I don't know if there's enough information, I guess what I'm saying, to, uh, about that building to convince somebody out in Clackamas County that voted no to now change their mind and vote yes, if that's the biggest cost 
uh, that's a you know, component of the bond. Because it doesn't affect them. Because it doesn't that, affect them. That's right. why part of my sentiment is to go ahead and do this, get more information, you know, to help back up our decisions. But at some point, this board needs to make a decision and move ahead. Yeah. But and it needs to be sooner rather than later, as far as I'm concerned. But at some point, even if, if, if we gather more information, if we get more specifics, at some point we need to decide if we're going to stay in Eugene Field or not. And that has to be a fairly... And we have to have an alternative, I think. It seems clear to me now, and I don't know why it didn't seem clear before the bond election, but I think if we would have said, here's your two choices, um, public, we... You know, you pass the bond, or next year the kids are in modulars here. And, and our decision this time could be a bond for, say, rehab in Eugene Field and doing that. But it still has to be backed up, I think, with an alternative. Here's your alternative if it doesn't happen. Uh, because we have a responsibility to provide that alternative rather than just say, okay, well, we're going to go status quo until we present another option. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, your bond is too complicated as well. It made, it made perfect sense to us, but if it was a, if we, if we, if it was just focused on Eugene Field and possibly even some safety improvements, I think we had a better chance of passing versus we threw Mark Twain in there and a bunch of other stuff and it really metal the waters for people. If, if we if, if we decide to close Eugene Field, then, then there has to be a list of fatal reasons for that. Then they will, we'll need to see that list. The, the, the voters will need to see that list. And I mean, it needs to be clearly defensible. defensible. Um, you know, yeah. So let's start work on that list. That's, that's let, let's start work on that list and then try to defend it or attack them. Attack those, you know, put our team right down and go for it and see if it. See if we can you know, remediate and fix, you know, see what that so costs. It's, so it's, we're going to spend some money to get the information. Don't we? All, I mean, haven't we kind of assembled it in three or four, 75 different studies? Not, to, the, not to that detail. Yeah, not to that detail. There is, yeah. Okay, there no, is no structural no. thing. Okay. No, a couple of structural I'll walk through to structural Walk, analysis, yeah. but but deeper analysis. I think. Con, they're just talking concepts. Now you're talking to the next level. Okay. 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 Um, one of the things that we just talked about briefly is the number of students in that building. And one of our conversations, um, as our consultants pointed out this evening, lots of issues are interconnected. And one thing that we have not addressed in this district in my service here is attendance boundaries. So if we're talking about 300 students versus 500 students in Eugene Field, and we have empty spaces or underutilized building space in other buildings, uh, why aren't we talking about attendance boundaries? Putting, making efficient use of, of all of our space is what we really should be doing, I think, before we contemplate uh, building new buildings and asking the voters to fund that. We start I think that was something that I heard in the, in the bond election as well. We start going down that path, we also need to throw in out of district transfers and no, how, that, yeah, how that's those, in the mix. Those might be uh, that important things. Space? Yeah, I mean, it might be mm -hmm. important things to conclude in that discussion. I mean, we're responsible for the stewardship of this school district. Mm -hmm. So, in my sense, David, I think that's, that's all valid. My sense is part of the visioning process will also dig to the root of some of what you're you're discussing, uh, in, in order to maybe get to that root and find out though what what the merits or lack of merits of Eugene <clears throat> Field are. Uh, that that's where this the specific structural additional digging, and then that will be contributed to your conversation in my mind anyway, related to the visioning process and some of those goals that you begin to identify for yourself. Maybe attendance boundary changes and changes to in and out of district transfers are warranted, I don't know, but it should be in combination with what we know about Eugene Field. Many districts uh, adjust attendance boundaries routinely, automatically by policy every two years or so. So, something to, to contemplate. So generally, Tim, uh, do I hear any objection to continuing with this? I mean, I've made some notes to uh, some some modifications to this, but continuing no, to, to establish this, this like group. general consensus. What's a realistic time frame? Well, I placed here January of 2014 as as options for consideration by the board. So that's three months. Uh, I mean, you know, I think two, maybe three meetings, uh, opportunity for them, and maybe if, if there is an additional need for some some uh, uh, investigative work or um, exploratory work into the building, that would allow opportunity for that to occur. That needs to get on. If we're going to do that, it needs to be happening right away. By the time you get a contract in place and get people in there, you get a report, 
You can easily eat up, eat up two months, two, three months. We, we actually, and we, meaning Scott Pillar and I, have actually done a little investigative work specific to, to that uh, already and have I actually identified uh, an engineer out, out of Oregon City who has uh, called ZCS Engineering and we're asking, asking them for some scope of service specific to Eugene Field. Uh, however, what drew us to this engineering firm is their success in, um, in uh, providing uh, seismic analysis of schools in school districts and public entities and uh, being a partner in submitting uh, uh, the state uh, a seismic grant and having uh, a very good success rate at doing that. Uh, and so in order for us to apply for a seismic grant, whether it would apply to Eugene Field, Mark Twain, View Creek, or any other school that we ultimately select, it's typically just one school that is part of that seismic grant, we have to have additional investigation from a seismic standpoint in order for that to occur. We've never had all of our schools in Silver Falls District evaluated from a seismic standpoint. We have Schlater a little bit. We have Eugene Field a little bit. We have the Doug Amiot reports uh, that are specific to four buildings, but not for the rest of the buildings in the district. So from my perspective, I think ZCS Engineering, based upon our research to this point, will provide <coughs> will also provide an avenue for us to qualify for the state seismic grant, and we believe they have the expertise to do the additional investigation to each in the field. What about the other aspects of the building? Uh, seismic is just one piece. We've got, we've got the ventilation issues, we've got electrical right. issues, we've got fire suppression issues. They do the, the they do the full uh, uh, engineering studies. Wally, they're, they're what drew, what might, I guess maybe I may need to be clear. What drew us to them is their success with a qualifying for okay. seismic. They'll do the full down. They do. They okay. do, and they have a, quite. A, and we've checked multiple references to this point. Um, have from I think three school districts, two or three, and uh, have been very positive and pleased with the references. Have, have they? What's their I guess track record for taking you know and. A building that looks old and saying no, you can fix that. Is there, are there are there places out there that are successful that specialize in in taking something old and mm -hmm. and, and finding the, um, the the value in it mm -hmm. and have a, you know and have a track record of that. And and if they come through and say you know look we've done this and if they look at this and go you know I mean. We can dig a little. You know what I'm saying? I do, we, and know. we can dig a little bit deeper into that. What 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 we have discovered, or what we haven't discovered, is this this group leaning toward one way or another. I, what you're getting at is, it, would this be an engineering firm that would come in and say, "You just need to tear that building down." You need a building. Yeah, right. Here, here. We can do that for you. That's that's. I'm I'm I'm, I'm afraid of that. Right. right. Of, the, of it coming off as saying, "Ah, they just using their, they're just here, and, you know, make some consulting fees and get their foot in the door for a new building." Uh, we can check a little bit deeper. I, I am aware of a couple of schools that they have remediated, however, old schools that they have remediated uh, from a, to, to a seismic uh, code compliance standard and have been successful with in, in conjunction with the state seismic grant. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, I'm, That's I'm, good point. Picking around structural people. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. The work I do, I, I've learned if I don't get the answer, I want from one structural engineer, I'll go to a different one and get a, a different <laughs> So it's, 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 more, it's more of an art than real science. So. <laughs> yeah. For the school task force, you kind of mentioned having people that were more middle ground people being part of that. I, I would see the benefit of having people that were also for seriously closing Eugene Field and people that were seriously, you know, interested in keeping it open. Because then you'd really have, I mean, I'm not looking for, you know, fist pounders or anything like that. But at the same time, you know, have a different, you know, thought out process of why. They, that I think that would be actually beneficial to have the whole gamut of types of people, not just in the middle. Are you looking for names from yes, us? From that, us? That Eventually, yeah, at some point, yeah, whether it's tonight or email, no one. Yeah. So I agree. That's a good point, Julie. Okay. Yeah. I think that's that's what I'm after as well. We need to make a decision on the of the plan. We've got two old buildings now hanging over our head: Schlater and Eugene Field. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to talk about another one of them. Too. <laughs> 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 Do you need board action to establish this task force? No. Okay, so really what you need is names and then we need to contact those people. And, yeah. Um, do you, well I guess you can ask us or we can talk about it now. 
Um, do you want us to, how do you want that process to go? We recommend the MCU, you contact them. Um, would it help to make board personal invitations to people after we've discussed it and agreed that those are the right people? Or I think it would be good to uh, uh, to solicit names from each of you. Uh, I think, in, especially if Owen, you have a few names in mind, I have a few names in mind, and I think we sort of generate this list, and if the list comes up to be 20 people, I think that's probably too much. Uh, and so uh, we'll put that out in front of you, and then we, we whittle that list down to a group of 10 uh, agreeable people that we think would be a balance and provide all perspectives as well as good conversation and, and resource from a from a facility standpoint as well as, well as a you know educational planning standpoint. So that that makes sense to me, Owen. So okay. my sense is I'll send you an email saying please submit your names. I'll compile this and get back to you. And that's assuming there's consensus on the board. Again, there's no action required, but if there's anybody in disagreement, I would want to sort that out with you. I think there's consensus. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Andy, sale of steel hammer property. Well, well, uh, uh, Tim, I, you know, there, there is no restriction on this agenda. I mean, I, we can get to steel hammer property, but if you had anything related to that topic, it sounds like you did. Well, I uh, just now might be a good time for you to bring that up. <laughs> I'm going to buy the property. <laughs> no, no, but it relates to the sale of the steel hammer property too, and I'm just. I've just been thinking lately that, I mean, we had a lot of things on the bond that um, were going to be really good things and th you know, things we need. One thing I'm really concerned about is technology in this district and what we're going to need you know, to put kids and teachers to, for the state testing coming, for Common Core, for all that stuff. I'm really concerned about that. Um, I think we need to... And I think we need to look at look at all our dollars, look at all our funds. You know, we have some construction excise tax dollars. We have some of that stuff. I think we need to just start moving ahead with some of this stuff in some kind of fashion. And I'm not sure how that would look, but um, I think we need to make some decisions as a board and say, okay, we're going to do this much for technology, and we're going to take the money not out of the general fund, but out of construction excise tax, or you know, wherever. I just think we need. I don't think we can wait to pass another bond to address some of the issues that, we're, that we have to address. And I think we need to make some decisions, you know, say, okay, we're gonna sell steel hammer, we're gonna use that money for this purpose or whatever. Um, and that's, a, you know, the tearing down of Schlater might be beyond that scope of what we, what we can afford, but at the same time, we decided in 2006 that building wasn't safe for kids when we passed the bond for the high school. And why would we leave it sitting there? For so I know, you know, I know our options are very limited, but I think that's something we need to take a good look at too, is how much would it cost to tear that building down? Because I think that would, to get rid of the old part of that building, I think would increase our um, options to do something with Eugene, to move kids out of Eugene Field, if that's what we decide to do. I just think we need to. I just think we need to start looking at all our dollars and moving ahead with some of these things, even if it's piecemeal, you know, technology-wise or security-wise or whatever. But we need to start moving ahead with some of this stuff, or we're going to get two or three years down the road and say, "Crap, we're, you know, we're in deep trouble." Because I've already heard from schools that don't have who have, you know, piloted some of the state tests. Coming I mean, to Mark Twain did, and they didn't have the time or the capacity to get all their kids through and because it took a lot more time than what they what they had originally thought it would and I just think we really need to and I know we're going through the visioning process and you know taking a year to do that but I think some of this stuff is no brainer and like the technology and some things like that I think we just need to look at our dollars that we would have available to spend for some of this stuff and start moving ahead with some of it. from operational point of view. Yeah. The efficiency of Gary's operation is really horrible right now because he's got he's got higher end computers and he has all kinds of junk out there. If he could have, he could standardize, his costs would be reduced. Plus, um, he'd have a much more efficient operation. You know, we heard tonight from our, our consultants again that uh, our budgeting's got to follow our priorities. And I think we, from listening to everybody's priorities, I think we're pretty on pretty well on the same page. I, my sense is, you know, we, I don't know where exactly we're going to come out with our our process here. But um, you know, I'm I'm in, I'm in favor, Tim. But we're not going to implement anything if we don't budget and spend our, our resources on it. Mm -hmm. 
I agree with Tim. I think that technology has to be a priority, and we're a little bit behind right now as it is. So I really favor an action plan um, that we can implement with the resources that are available to us outside. Excuse me, the general fund. <coughs> yeah, we just, there are some question marks, like you said, um, or question marks on the bond for people. There's a lot of different components, and it just kind of and yeah. you know, selling some of the district property eliminates some question marks because that was one of the things that came up. Uh, <coughs> you know, if we end up uh, demolishing the old, old campus, I mean, that would eliminate a major question mark. Uh, so, you know, the I'm not advocating for that at the moment, but just saying that that would be certainly a benefit. That building can be taken down cheaper than I most people realize. Well, they're te tearing down the old Ritzville High School, which I took pictures of here a few months ago. They're tearing it down. It just started a couple days ago, and it's interesting. It, it had it very similar in terms of, I'm not sure size, but um, looks very similar to this high school. So I was going to make some contacts up there and just find out what they're getting it done for. I think it was purchased by a private Entity, so it's done on a private basis. I'm sure oh, so they're, taking, they're piecing it apart. Then I don't know. I'm going to find out some details. It's, it's been sitting there condemned with literally a chain link fence around it for I think like 15 years. There's a company in Portland that does this kind of work, and they take a building like that down with two or three guys and just you know, and within a month. Wow. I got equipment that just basically takes a build, takes to chop out of the building, separates material for, for recycling, and. Way it goes. We, we, oh, excuse me. Oh, I was just going to say we're always going to have the people, some people who are saying, oh, we've got to save the old buildings and we, you know, we like mm -hmm. the looks of those old buildings, let's retrofit. But, you know, we're, we have more information than most people because, because of where we sit. And I think eventually, sometimes we just have to make a decision to say, no, that school's not safe for kids. We said that in 2006. It's been, seven years so now we're going to take it down and that we don't you know we don't know what we're going to do with the space but it does open up our options to do something else with this with this campus yeah but of course that hinges on available dollars and things like that but i think we really need to take a hard look at that and i guess i would request andy that we start getting some information on what it would cost to take that building down and also um things we can do you know Talk to Gary and things we can do to start increasing our technology capacities and things like that. I'll and send look you, at our available dollars. I'll send you contact. Okay. For them. I don't know. I've just really been, it's just really been bugging me lately, some of this stuff, and I just think we need to move forward with some of it. Yeah, I, I think on the technology, we especially have to move forward. Um, I think the question I would like to ask, ask to our staff is what technology is. A force, a force multiplier in the classroom, and what is what what technology just gets in the way? I want to know what they like. They've been playing around with it. They've been they got colleagues in other districts. We've got all kinds of technology all over the all over the district. What works and what gets in the way? What, how much money do we need to, to put towards this? I mean, what's what's it take to make a, a real difference? What's what's the plan? Well, Andy, was, you were talking about telling me about servers and stuff the other day that. Yeah, I, I, I mean the uh, the, uh, the the technology, the infrastructure technology budget from the bond was 1.5 million itself, uh, and that would have brought that would have uh, uh, made every building uh, uh, relatively uh, the same with access and use, uh, even with some hardware. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I think if you're talking specific technology. 1.5 million is all the money you have. I mean, truly, when you speak about construction, excise tax, sale, monitor, or excuse me, monitor, uh, steel hammer property, and so forth, 1.5 million is probably about it. And, and again, I, I can get those figures and put them in front of you and uh, and go from there. Uh, and then and then there's nothing left. I mean, it's like living on your savings, and your savings yeah, is gone. So I, I think that's that's the that's the, the lens I'd, I'd like you just kind of keep in mind here. That the, the, that's why we went for a bond, and, and that's why I think at some point in the future we have to go for a bond again because affordability. We aren't able to do what we need to do in this district to get the job done well, with a construction yeah. excise tax or savings. Um, well, then we need to maintain it. Once we get in place, then we have to have a regular maintenance. Otherwise, we're right. going to be right back in the same boat. Now so, we've got to centralize the budgeting at that point. Right. So schools aren't, individual schools aren't making a decision on technology. Gary, Gary and Cup. 
I have asked Brett and Gary to submit a proposal to me and they've given me a range uh, to this point. Uh, and again, keeping in mind operation of the, the technology within the district, I ask them what what, what's your biggest nightmare? And the, uh, their lar largest nightmare is, uh, of course, a, a down servers. And we're still operating with two servers in this district that are literally 15 years old. Uh, and if one goes down, you know, we're, we're out. And, and we're out of commission. The entire district is out of commission for however long it takes to get that server back up. From Brett's perspective, minor. Uh, yeah, uh, a tech uh, server upgrade in this district would, would cost in a range of about thirty-five to sixty thousand dollars. That's just to give us the backup capacity to what we have right now. So what I told Brett is that I would bring a proposal to you at some point in the very near future to say, what do we need? We we need a backup. You know, in other words, if the server goes down, I have to have a backup ready to go because this district functions so much on technology. And uh, I've given him, let's say, twenty five thousand dollars, maybe thirty thousand dollars. Brett, what can you do with that? Can you provide some reliable backup? With that in this district, and we so these server space, I mean, uh, the server farm someplace. I mean, there's got to be well, and, and we're looking at other options as well. Uh, you know, but and, and I'm not a technology guru, but I know that there are some. There's some questions about you know offsite hosting. What 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 are the advantages and disadvantages? I can't tell you what those are, Owen, or what the costs of those are from a, especially from a long term standpoint. Well, the so technology is changing so quickly. I personally think it's probably the way to go. Just just, mm -hmm. just in the utility requirements for servers now, the heat generation of these this equipment is huge, and it, and not only have to buy the equipment and install it, now you have to have the infrastructure in there to to pull the heat out and and keep the temperature requirements and keep the cleanliness down and. It's just not a room anymore. It's there's a lot more than that. So, so part of the purpose of, of my, my input is that uh, you know I think take your pick. Is it technology? Is it infrastructure? Is it what do teachers want? What's not working? Is it backup servers? Is it offsite servers? I mean, take take your pick, uh, and you're in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, very quickly, uh, yeah, and you still have old buildings that need maintenance. <laughs> you understand where I'm going with this. Yeah, so so, so it, it is part of the prioritization process and, uh, that, that we need to do um, uh, based upon, uh, and, and so some of the suggestions that, well, while I agree with them, uh, Tim, everything from potentially demolishing Schlater and you know getting out of Eugene Field, uh, if we did that without a bond, you have no more money. The I, know, I, I, and I understand that. And I don't want us to go and spend all the construction excess tax dollars sure. to bring our sure. technology like we were going to with the bond. I, that's not wise. But at the same time, I think there's you know we need to look at some steps we could maybe take to start that process. In my mind, anyway. And another thing, I'm just going to throw out, and I'll probably get shot down for this, and it may not be, and it may totally not be the right thing to do. But one thing, maybe I think maybe we should we could borrow money. I mean, I hate for our district to do that, but I think we have some real needs, and maybe we should look at the options of borrowing some money and paying it off over time. And if we do get a bond passed down the road, some of that that money could maybe go to pay off the a loan or something. I mean, I've heard other districts do that. I don't know if it's the right thing to do. I don't know if it's the wise thing to do. I'm just worried we're going to get we're going to. Especially with the technology pieces of things, I'm just worried we're going to get heaven in a few years. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm just I just wanted to throw that out there as another option too. Yeah. Looking just kind of looking back, have we have we possibly just made you know errors by maintaining high staffing levels and low classroom sizes at the at the expense of our of our um, technology budgets. And, yes. and so, you know, when we did that, you know, the, we, we all did that to keep class sizes down. But have we, hindsight being always being 2020, are we maybe thinking that that was a mistake and maybe we need to look at that, putting a higher priority on our budgets, on our maintenance and our technology? Um, and so that's a very tough thing to say, but. Well, without a bond, I think at some point you get there yeah. one way or another. Yeah. Um, that's a very awful option, but maybe that's something we got to do. I think generally the answer is yes. Everything, everything, everything's on the table here. Compared to general maintenance, general yes. maintenance, right, Tom? I mean, we've we've prioritized staffing because that's yes. our job, instruction, right? Right. Uh, as but now to here we are. Right. Right. <clears throat> right. Okay. 
I would just say that you know the economy is not stable, and to go ahead and you know for the future think about doing a loan. I just I think we have to maintain our budget. I know it's not the easiest thing to do, or even the most. You, we want computers. We want technology out there. I think we need to get really creative. But I taken out a loan. I just I, I have. I'm not for it just because it's putting you in debt and you don't know what your future holds. Still, it's not looking that great. I'm not going to say anything. <coughs> not right now. <laughs> we can talk about all. Stuff calls, you know, because we want to know what's best for kids. And yeah. What's best for kids is to have lower class sizes and. Well, I think you're in a good position to make some decisions, and, and one of them, I believe, is in front of you. And while there's no action on it tonight, I'm proposing that you take action on a resolution at your September meeting, and that's related to the sale of steel hammer. Uh, I, I think, uh, really, by by law, you you make the decision to say whether you want to designate it as a property that's no longer required for school purposes, and you do that through a resolution and. Uh, I take it from there, and we put it on the market, very similar to what you did for Monitor School. And and so I'm, I'm hoping that you can have a, a little conversation here tonight about whether there's anything else that you individually and as a board need in order to make that designation at, at the September meeting. Um, to, to this point, I think you've you've identified some a variety of reasons for for you know getting out of a steel hammer, uh, and that is uh, it's um, you know the, the the overall total land that you have available for use for future use of school buildings when you think of Robert Frost and Mark Twain and all the other properties that you have in this district, even Schlater now for that matter, uh, that you have an abundance of property and that you can afford to move uh, away from Steel Hammer. Uh, I think the location is questionable for a school. I think I've heard that from many of you as well, uh, that at one point in time, that's where I think the, this this board and the, 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 the former uh, elementary district believed that a school could be constructed, but the growth of the city of Silverton and the community is not so much in that area as much as it is in other parts of town. Uh, uh, the configuration of the property is kind of questionable. It's a little goofy, triangular, partially triangular uh, uh, shape with very, very little frontage off the Steel Hammer Road. Uh, and I think based upon your uh, engagement process, there's distinct public interest in seeing you move that property. I think most people know you have that property, what are you doing with that property? Uh, and so I think from a diligence standpoint, if there are any additional reasons that you'd like to kind of throw in that mix, you can bring those out right now. But in my mind, those are solid reasons for why you can move from steel hammer property and put it on the market. Yeah, I agree, but should we also be talking about the triangle piece at Mark Twain and the lower piece at Robert Cross? Yeah. Yes. Y yes. I mean, you, you, sure. I mean, it's it's entirely up to up to the board. Uh, you asked me to do a little bit more investigation about the uh, uh, Robert Frost property, and I have worked with Dean Oster a little bit on that. And he's done some investigation on the, both that and the Mark Twain property, and those are both uh, saleable, dividable properties. In fact, the Robert Frost property, about 15 acres below uh, Robert Frost School itself, is uh, is actually a, a portion of the approved West, Li West Side Land Use Development uh, 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 plan by the city of Silverton, uh, uh, specific to development 20, 30, 40 years down the road, that, that portion would be used ideally from the city standpoint for residential, maybe senior residential, maybe some additional commercialization specific to the needs of the residences in that area. So I know you wouldn't hear any opposition from the city if the school district had an interest in seeing if they could divide off a portion of that property at this point. Uh, I, I would caution you on doing them uh, simultaneously. I'd say focus on steel hammer see how that goes uh, we are hearing that the, that the market for development property is yeah. it's it's not high volume right now we're hoping that steel hammer will be saleable but I think you can learn a lot from the sale of steel hammer that maybe you could apply to yeah, I understand. it was my belief market a little bit yeah is, yeah. is steel hammer the more valuable than Robert Frost property we haven't appraised Robert Frost I don't know steel hammer is appraised at about four hundred twenty-five thousand. Yeah. 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 yes okay <laughs> Yeah, I say we move and okay, sell and steal. Mm -hmm. We're the starting point. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we've investigated that you need a, none of these properties have the potential to build a school. So we yeah. and when people say, "What are you doing with it?" Well, we're saving it for when times are tough, and I think times are tough. So that's what we've that's what we've been holding on to it for. Um, 
Sounds like the right thing to do to move forward with that. Has there been a, con a conversation yet with the remaindermen on the deed on, on the deed on that uh, property? With who? Uh, would be the heir, I guess, on the, the property on Steel Hammer? Yes, and, 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 and we have um, um, uh, uh, Garrett Heeman Robertson, I can't remember his name, looking into that uh, for us. Uh, Gordon. Gordon Hanna. What's the last name? Hanna. Hanna, yeah. Yeah, a couple conversations with Gordon. Uh, and he's uh, he's looking into that as well. But there was quite a bit of research uh, completed in 2007 uh, specific to that property. There was a consideration for trade at the time. And so quite a bit of investigative work was done uh, specific to that. And the title is very clear that, you know, there is an, there is an easement that would have to be transferred to uh, the new owner. Uh, a water access to a one-inch main off of steel hammer would need to occur. And then we would have to honor the heirs' uh, uh, a requirement that 20% of the revenue from the sale of steel hammer be placed uh, in essentially a, like a trust account and then the interest from that be used to support special education in the district. So yeah, all of those would be honored. So there's nothing new since 2007 uh, that was understood by the heirs at the time. So unless something changed, which is what Gordon will be looking into for us, uh, there's no concern. So unless I hear objections from you or I don't have a consensus again, I'll, I'll have a resolution prepared for you for the steel hammer property at your September 98. Okay. Sounds good. good. Thank you. Okay, anything else on facility planning and funding? I bring up one more thing because I know we have a few members of the audience here this evening uh, from Community Roots School, and uh, and and you know while you can have a, a conversation, uh, otherwise we have a very good relationship with Community Roots School. Community Roots School is currently housed in uh, four classrooms on the, <coughs> the James Street side of the, of the Schlater campus, and and uh, what we did discover from from especially from the engagement process and some, some conversation that there clearly is an interest uh, in this community to include Community Root School, and I think it's fair to say Bethany Charter School, uh, in conversations specific to facility planning and what look, that looks like in the future. So I'm sharing that with you publicly uh, because I think there is a need for that. And while there wasn't necessarily uh, an om omission so much uh, uh, during the bond, I think it was just a matter of fact. That's how we moved ahead for whatever reason that was, that Community Roots and Bethany Charter were not so much inclusive within the project. Uh, the, the, the interesting point of note uh, specific to community roots, which may put you in a, in a I think, in a unique position of consideration uh, about the, that option in our school district, is what role we, you play as a board and we play as a school district in supporting the facility needs of a charter school. Uh, and I think that's sort of new territory. Uh, Bethany Charter has a lease facility from us, and as long as they keep functioning, I'm sure that's not going to change, and you know, we've offered them to sell it and purchase it and all that is good, but that's they're kind of taking care of. Community Roots is not. Uh, and Community Roots is actually uh, in, in their, uh, they have one, an additional year in the lease of their contract specific to Schlater. And I have uh, indicated to the administration at Community Roots that uh, assuming that I hear no major pursuit by this board to do anything of substantial substantial to uh, uh, to uh, uh, the Schlater campus at least over the course of the next year uh, that I'd like to even offer them an additional year in the Schlater campus now that we know that the bond has failed and that makes sense to me and I think that's a vote of confidence in community root school while they're looking at other options I think they're also hopeful, hopeful uh, that they can work uh, in tandem with you as a board as as we move ahead in facility planning for the future. Let's say if a bond was placed on the ballot in the next year or two, that the consideration would be given by you for what does that mean for community roots. Get their input, have some conversation, and while there may be some questions about you know the the, the, the responsibility of you you know uh, uh, being responsible for the facilities of community roots, I think there is room for conversation specific to how can we partner. And Community Roots does have a capital campaign. They are developing revenue. They are uh, uh, generating some revenue for, for their future. And I think they're looking for a cooperative partner as they continue to have with Silver Falls School District. But it will be a, a, a little different as uh, uh, maybe an approach. As an example, if we were to do something with the Schlater campus, and this has been discussed about lifting up Eugene Field and placing it on the Schlater campus, 
would there be sufficient opportunity to include something specific to community roots in that conversation and what that could look like, partially even funded by community roots or maybe a, a long-term lease that will allow for the, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, funding of, of what some of that accommodations for community roots may look like. So bottom line, my message to you is um, I, I think it needs to be a consideration in the future. I think you just need to kind of have that in the back of your mind and begin processing that about what that looks like for one of your, uh, as a sponsoring district, one of your charter schools to be, be leaning on you a little bit and asking for some collaboration and assisting them with facility planning into the future. And unless you have any conversation, I just want to make sure that I, I stated that. Anybody have anything to say? Personally, I don't know why we couldn't work some something out down the line. I think Community Roots is doing an awesome job, and they're a nice option for people to bring people, you know, for people to come to this district. Another option, which makes our district even stronger. So, my personal opinion is I don't see why we couldn't figure something out, whatever that might that kind of idea. And, yeah, is it? Yeah. You know, I think it's important. They're a part of this district the same as any other schools. It's been my position from the inception of community use. Yeah, I think that we're really obligated to help them with their facilities. So, is there is there can we develop like or maybe there is policy, but can we develop some policies for charter schools in general that takes care of community roots and Bethany and another charter school for one of the features? Just that way, everyone's treated the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you can do whatever. Whatever I'm just saying. Just, yeah. Throwing that out there just so right. people know what the rules of the game are. This is how all yeah, and, works. And, and I guess my, my at, at first blush, my you know that that would have to be that would be have to be a kind of a very global uh, yeah. approach because the charter schools are so different in many ways. Their charters are distinct, and even their lease agreements are distinct. But that's correct, Tom. I think if there's a general sort of supportive policy related to maintaining the integrity and the facilities of our current charter schools, again, that's all within assumptions that they maintain the elements of the charter school law, that we still want to continue yeah, a good yeah, relationship, all of that, and I think we will. There's uh, many, yeah, yeah, but, there's, right. yeah, yeah there's, there's many questions and many angles. Right? Just the language might be interesting. Yeah, Maybe I don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what that would look like, but yeah. I yeah, think I, I, I... <clears throat> Anything else on that? Okay. 2013 draft board goals development. Are you looking for specific goals, or do you want to, you want to take this one? Are you Is that why we have a visioning process going on? I think the visioning process that we talked about tonight is a major one. I'm thinking one goal. One goal. <laughs> <laughs> one goal. It encompasses so much of other things. That's easy. Uh, yeah, it, 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 let me just quick, quickly highlight. You heard these last at the last board meeting. You know, last last year you had uh, uh, a, a transitional goal for Common Core State Standards. You had the goals for early release days and instructional strategy sharing. You had a cohort graduation goal. Uh, and, and a goal that you've had essentially every year since forever, a math, reading, and writing goal, and I think those are valuable. Uh, and then the one was spe other specific to implementation of your long-range facility plan. So, um, you know, it, it clearly wouldn't be out of reason for you to specify something like visioning, but I also don't want to minimize the need for something else that may be specific that you need to continue to keep in front of you uh, and, and drive your... Uh, and, and drive this this the Common Core board. is going to be a big deal. The Common Core, core we need to keep. It needs focus. We had a lot of discussion tonight about facilities and that needs to be in there. They're all, kind, they're all kind of related. I mean, keep the ones about instruction for sure. Just throw something in about the visioning process and we're good. Which encompasses all of those. Yeah. You know, would, would, it, would it be reasonable to, uh, uh, to and, and again, I can craft something for you, but to, to, to draft uh, a goal that really is more around the visioning process, uh, you know, with some uh, delineation specific to those areas that you have to remain main targeted, like uh, Common Core transition and and uh, in you know facilities or, or or whatever. I mean, pick two or three of those. So you still focus largely on your visioning purpose for the year, uh, but you have some subsets with that, within that. That makes sense to me. Well, I don't know the. Uh 
Common Core, the, the uh, facilities things you're talking about tonight are more tactical, mm -hmm. where the visioning is more strategic. There's um, more of an implementation component to the first two. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're a little bit different. I don't want to minimize the importance of those either by by kind of wrapping it all together. Yeah. I'd like to keep them a little more. Those, the instructional ones, the common core, I'd like to keep those okay. personally specific and, and add a new one for the visioning. And uh, I mean, you could do away with the facilities one that and, and tie that one to the visioning. Sure. Okay. And then tie them all together by saying how the you know, common core and everything relates to. By doing that, you're saying we probably won't do anything on facilities this year? Maybe we won't, but I'd like to develop some some <clears throat> one of the goals that has a time for implementation with you know embedded within the goal, so that it's not just a that, that to me changes a, a goal, changes an aspiration into a goal. You know, if you aspire towards something, it's just kind of out there, and then if we put that time component, so then it, then I think we have some implementation component. Like for what kind of goal? Well, like for a goal with, um, well, I was thinking that the te a technology um, as a component of um, of the facilities. So if we had a, a timeline uh, goal in there for some facilities, then we may have a strategy, or a portion of that may be um, that we're going to actually implement some of the technology upgrades. Um, that's interesting. The visioning thing is, a year-long process. You could yeah. do a sub, whatever you call it. You know, make part of that, make part of the visioning goal. Look at technology, whatever upgrades we can do in the next six months or. And it's outside, time on it's it. outside the visioning. Okay, I know. It's, I'm not great. Visioning goals. Visioning is long term. It's, it's other stuff. I think stuff we want to do this year. We talk a little bit about measurable. It really should be measurable somehow as well. Right. It's the acronym is SMART, the specific, measurable, attainable. I can't remember what the R stands for. SMART. So make a specific one around technology and a specific one around aging field. And uh, can, can, can I suggest that, that it, you know, if, if, if you want to have something around technology and use Eugene Field, that, that you allow me to craft a, a goal that can combine that into one? Because I, I hear you saying, yes, on, you know, let's do some investigative work on Eugene Field, which will no doubt involve technology. And I also hear you asking about, let's do some uh, assessment district-wide, which we've already done, but what can we do if we don't have any additional revenue sources? I believe that's also facility-related, and I can put that together and capture in one goal with something of a metric. I can provide that. Again, I'm, I'm trying to, your visioning process is going to be a big time suck. Don't, don't necessarily put that in minutes, but it, it, it's, going, it's going to be your priority this, this year. And, and, and while I think you can have maybe a second or a third goal that may not be as, as so, so prevalent, I, I just want to caution you that that visioning is going to take a lot of time. We can do the others, and some things that obviously that we do, we don't require to have a goal because we do them because you ask me to do them or you agree to do them. Uh, but they should be about around what your priorities are. Your priorities, uh, I hear you saying, are around visioning. I still hear a hint of, uh, of facilities and technology. I hear common core transition. Those are the three big ones that I hear from you. That sounds good. Does it sound good because it's getting close to 8 o'clock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my mind's kind of gone. It's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> No, I don't need to be flipping. So Andy, Andy out of those, I know it needs to be narrowed down somewhat. Out of those, which ones are we are we really dropping from last year then? Uh, uh, graduation uh, cohort tracking, which we do already, uh, and the other one is uh, uh, specific to the, the, the use of your early release okay. days, which we'll continue to do and have a plan for this year. Okay. Oh, and and. <clears throat> We haven't dropped uh, a specific target to math, reading, and writing, uh, or we've always included that. However, the caveat to that is you now have your achievement compact, which actually you'll have in, in form for approval at your September meeting. You've seen it a couple of times now, but that is very clear targeted uh, goals for uh, uh, the 40-40-20 the goal of the governor through 2025. So that, in a sense, in essence, takes care of itself. Yep. All right. I'll put those together. Anything else on goals? 
Anything else? Then we're adjourned. Thank you very much.